Well, good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's second meeting in 2017. We have apologies from John Finney. And can I just mention in the gallery, we also have the Speaker of the New Zealand Parliament, the Right Honourable David Carter, MP. We're very, very pleased to have you with us this morning. Agenda item number one is whether to take a decision on private. Item six in private, which is consideration of the written evidence received on the Criminal Finances Bill UK Parliament legislation, legislative consent motion. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item number two is our evidence session for the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service inquiry. And I welcome to the committee the Lord Advocate, the Right Honourable James Wolf QC, and David Harvey, Crown Agent and Chief Executive of the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service to the committee. I refer members to paper one and paper two and the Lord Advocate, I understand you don't tend to make a, an, an opening statement. I don't uh, uh, convener, um, but perhaps I can wish the committee a good new year. <laughs> and we reciprocate you. <laughs> to you and the Crown Agent. Um, it is uh, likely to be quite a long evidence session, so I propose maybe to take a, a comfort break and a suspension about 10, 11, 15, round about that, just so that um, we have a natural break. And with that, I invite questions from members. I believe you've got an opening one, Stuart Stevenson, then Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Lord Advocate, I, I just wanted to uh, give you the opportunity to lighten my personal darkness uh, because I got a little bit confused, I think, in uh, talking to the Cabinet Secretary about the nature of the relationship between the Lord Advocate, the government as a body, uh, individual ministers, and your independent role as the head of the prosecution service. And I think it would be useful if I heard your statement on it and then if I, I find supplementary questions, I might ask these. Uh, in, indeed. Um, the um, Lord Advocate, by statute under the Scotland Act, is a member of the Scottish Government, as is the uh, Solicitor General. Um, so, as Lord Advocate, I am a member of the Government. Um, and in that role, I have a number of responsibilities um, in relation to the uh, legal advice that, um, that government takes and upon which government acts um, and other um, constitutional responsibilities. Um, as head of the prosecution service and as head of the system of the investigation of deaths in Scotland, um, I am by statute required to exercise those functions entirely independently. Um, those are what are described as in the statute as my retained functions. And that term it refers to um, the fact that those are functions that the Lord Advocate exercised long before devolution. Um, uh, they go back uh, certainly to the 16th century. Um, they're the functions that as a matter of our constitution are essentially separate from the devolution settlement. They're, they're functions which um, attach to my office by virtue of the office and which uh, uh, predate and, and, and are independent of devolution settlement. And as I say, by statute, I exercise those functions independently. Um, uh, and indeed, I'm obliged to exercise them um, uh, independently of, of any other person, I think is the, the phrase. Um, uh, and so, um, in relation to those matters, I am personally responsible for the, um, the activities of those, the, those parts of the service. Um, I don't know whether that's helpful in sort of teasing out a little the two roles, the but two I'm, roles. I'm, yes. Uh, I mean, there, 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 there are two roles that I play and the important point from the perspective of this inquiry is that the role um, as head of the system of prosecution and system of investigation of deaths in Scotland is one I exercise independently um, and personally. 
Uh, perhaps just a tiny supplementary. Are you satisfied that ministers are always clear which hat you're wearing when they are interacting with you? Um, I've, uh, I, I, I've not been aware of any difficulty uh, in, in, in that regard. Um, and I've certainly not detected any um, uh, interests on the part of ministers in trespassing on my independent responsibilities as prosecutor. Thank you. That's a helpful, okay. convener. Douglas Ross. Thank you, convener. Lord Advocate, can I ask, since your appointment, what's the single biggest feeling you've identified in the Crown Office and Procurator for Fiscal Service? I'm not, well, I've, I've looked at the evidence that you've uh, received with interest. Um, it's identified a number of issues, and I've no doubt we'll look at the detail of those uh, in the course of the evidence session. Um, a number of these are issues that the service itself has recognized uh, and identified. Um, uh, and... Um, the service itself is uh, taking steps to seek to address those. And I've no doubt that as we go through the morning, uh, we'll be discussing some of that work in, in uh, more detail. Um, uh, so um, I, I, I hope you'll forgive me if I don't uh, take up your invitation to pick out one particular issue and identify that as, as um, uh, inherently a, 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 a failing on the part of the service. Um, there are a number of challenges that the service needs to address. You've heard evidence about them. Many of these are challenges that the service itself recognises uh, and which the service itself is taking steps to uh, to deal with. Um, one of the issues that you've heard evidence about is um, uh, uh, relates to staff and you've also had some evidence about the um, Fair Futures programme which the Crown Agent and the Senior Management are putting into effect to seek to uh, seek to uh, address some of those issues. Um, you've heard evidence about the um, uh, issues that uh, relate perhaps to the broader criminal justice system and the way that operates and um, the challenge that that presents for all of us, including the Crown. And you've also got evidence that um, work is being done, uh, particularly through the Court Service Evidence and Procedure Review, to seek to effect a transformational change that will address uh, uh, some of those issues. Um, and in relation to the um, position of, of victims, um, uh, we recognise that there are uh, challenges um, for the service in um, providing support for uh, victims in the way that victims would uh, most like support to be given. And the former Solicitor General, um, Leslie Thompson, uh, carried out a study and her review has been published in the uh, last week, which points uh, the way forward. So I'm not going to take up your kind invitation to uh, pick out one particular issue. There are a number of challenges the service has to meet um, and steps are being taken to seek to, to meet those challenges. I wouldn't really phrase it as an invitation. It's a question from a committee looking at the office in which you manage, asking that after six months in the uh, position as head of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, had you identified one issue that you think really needs to be addressed as a priority? Um, and I can understand, you know, in your answer, you are giving many issues, but then if there are many issues, nothing is a priority. Uh, and I have some concerns about that. However, given uh, your response to that point, do you think anyone could read the 20 pages submitted by the Crown Agent in response to our inquiry, uh, which we've had to go through, and consider that the Crown Office is really taking seriously a number of the concerns, because I, I read it very carefully, and I was quite disappointed that a large bulk of what has been submitted by the Crown Agent and by the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is basically saying the evidence you've received is wrong. You know, there is no real concern here. And I worry, if that is the response to the evidence you've heard over five months of this inquiry, 
depending on what this Justice Committee uh, puts in our report, is anything really going to change or are you just determined to say uh, there are small things that we can tweak but really there won't be an overhaul of the justice system which witness after witness has said is required? Um, perhaps I can make three points in relation to that um, uh, uh, question. The first is I think it's an unfair reading of the Crown Agent's letter uh, to read it in the way that you read it. Um, I, 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 you, know, you will all have read it for yourselves. Um, um, he's sought to provide on a number of issues on which you've heard evidence um, uh, data which uh, is, puts the evidence that you've heard uh, in its proper context and I, I would invite the committee to focus on um, wh where data is available um, on, the, uh, on the relevant uh, data. Um, he certainly um, acknowledges, and the Crown Agent's here and will speak for himself, he acknowledges um, uh, the challenges um, which the service faces, and particularly the challenges which I mentioned a, a moment ago. Um, so that's, the first point is I think it's unfair reading of the Crown Agent's um, uh, position. The second point is um, there are, you have heard evidence from some witnesses where a, a look at the data that is available uh, does put the uh, position in a different light, and no doubt we'll discuss that as we go through the morning. Uh, the third point is that, yes, there are challenges. The Crown Office recognises those. Uh, I certainly recognise them. Um, I was very pleased to hear you say, Mr Ross, um, uh, in your question, or to refer to uh, the need for a, a significant change in the criminal justice system, because um, if I take... Um, uh, I take many things from the evidence you've heard, but one thing that came across to me very eloquently uh, was the support that it provided for the program of significant reform, which the parties in the justice system are currently engaged on, in particular through the evidence and procedure review. Um, much of that evidence, uh, it seems to me, makes the case for the need to do criminal justice in really quite a different way from the way we've been doing it. Can I ask, of the £700,000 you have to save in staffing costs over the next year, how many jobs do you anticipate losing in the Crown Office? Um, well, perhaps I can uh, invite the Crown Agent to deal specifically with the question of, of, of um, the, uh, that aspect of the budget. Uh, as, you, as you'll appreciate, um, uh, we have the same funding in cash terms as we've had in the previous year. I accept that that involves... Involves, in terms, that involves a real-term uh, cut, and um, perhaps the Crown Agent can uh, deal with that matter. <laughs> Happy to give a, a straightforward answer to that, Mr Ross. The, the position is that um, a 750,000 um, will equate probably to around 30. Um, and the, the basis for that, in terms of, of how that would be achieved, is that, that given the natural turnover that we have within the organisation, um, and this has been communicated to staff, it means that that um, uh, with the natural turnover we will be unable to replace everyone who goes, um, but we would anticipate that we would be in a position to um, uh, replace around half. And you say in your, your document that you submitted that um, the, the reduction in senior staff since 2009, I think you said there were 39 civil, senior civil servants as of October 2016, that's now 23, yes. so there's a, been a 16 uh, Vacants, yes. or 16 jobs have been reduced at the senior level, yet there's been an increase in the number of first promoted grade uh, prosecutors, the, the number of deputies and senior deputies. Yes. That's increased over a similar period by 69 from 285 to 534. Yes. Therefore, do you feel you've cut all the fat at senior levels and because you have increased the number of deputies and senior deputies, that that is the most vulnerable area for the job reductions as a result of your budget cuts? As, as I said in my letter, on the last occasion in relation to the budget, it is becoming increasingly challenging and, and, and options are reducing, there is no doubt about that. Um, but there are still choices that can be made. I think I've made reference to intelligent choices. And one of the key things that we would be seeking to do, um, because we identify um, the, the, the benefits that there are in having uh, a core number of, of frontline staff, is to, uh, is, uh, legal staff, is to, is to seek to protect that. So are you saying, yes, it would be more likely that these reductions would come from the deputy and senior deputy level? No, I'm saying that I'll be seeking to protect those grades. Mm -hmm. 
but it will be, so they're protected and you've already reduced the number of senior yes. civil servants. So where do the job losses come from? They will have to be from, from other grades. Okay. Can I ask, uh, maybe still with the, the Crown Agent, if I can, the other, I, I thought we were speaking about 1.4 million, therefore mm. half of that, 50% of staffing, yes. would come to 700,000, but you're seeing 750,000. Uh, sorry, I think that the overall number was 1.5 um, from recollection, um, because I think there was 0.1 in relation to capital okay. as well. Okay. As the so of the other £750,000 which you're mm. taking from non-staff costs, yes. you said in December um, that you couldn't really uh, give a timescale for that because you were waiting for an additional analysis. Has that now been done and when do you anticipate being able to see where those 50% uh, of the £1.5 million, million pound cut you've received in real terms from the Scottish Government will come from? That analysis is ongoing, but it's certainly um, uh, becoming more concrete. And I think I mentioned previously that we identified that there would be um, uh, savings um, uh, required um, from our estates um, in particular, and uh, uh, also uh, savings in relation to matters. I think you've noticed, for example, I think we provided evidence in relation to savings that we've made in relation to expert witness costs. For example, those costs have been going down um, and, and we would seek to, to reduce those kinds of costs. I also think I made reference to uh, seeking to uh, focus on, on pathology as well. So there are a variety of different levers that we're seeking to pull over a period of time, um, some of which might enable us actually to make more significant savings in certain areas that will then give us choices about how to redeploy mm -hmm. those funds. But is there a, a risk, however, that because you've still got that analysis to complete and the time scale's not in place, given you've got £1.5 million pounds in real terms to save this coming financial year, if that analysis takes longer, the time scale's then stretched, do you then have to save more in staffing over that period to compensate for not being able to achieve, achieve the 50% saving from non-staff costs? There is that risk, but I don't think it's a significant risk. Okay. Um, our plans are sufficiently um, uh, in train that we, we were uh, confident that we'll be able to do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lord Advey, could I ask if you would ever uh, make a request for additional funding from the Scottish Government that was naive or foolish? Well, I would like to think not. No. Okay, thank you. That's just for the record, based on the evidence we got from the Cabinet Secretary last week. Could I move away from funding and ask, what is the average time it takes your office to respond to letters from MSPs? I don't have that information to hand, but I'm would happy you, to, to, yeah. to... Would you be able to provide that, uh, both the average time it takes and the longest wait MSPs have had for correspondence from your office? It really goes back to evidence that we've heard during this inquiry about... Uh, I mean, there was a, a particular case that, that have struggled to communicate with you. I've had a, a letter that took some time to get a response, which was acknowledged uh, in the final response, but that's now actually when I've spoken to other MSPs seems to be a theme and then I thought well that does kind of relate to what we were told by defence solicitors that they quite often write to um, fiscals and fiscal deputies two or three times before they ever get a response and is it because they see at the very top of the organisation it takes a long time for the Lord Advocate, the Crown Agent, the Solicitor General etc to get back to correspondence? I'm certainly happy to uh, to see if that data can be provided. Thank you. Can I? Uh, and a lot of people want in, okay. so I'm going to leave it there, Douglas, um, and you'll get another opportunity to come in. There's people want in with supplementaries. Before they do, the point was raised about the submission that we've heard from the Crown Office agent, and I think I've, I've in three places, I've marked very good listening and um, definitely taking on, on board. But I have to say my... My, my initial reaction to this submission has been that a lot of the, the evidence hasn't been taken on board. You might be hearing what's said, but are you really listening? Particularly in relation to staff concerns, where we're all agreed, and you've been very fulsome, Crown Agent, in, in your description of the service, and we're all agreed it's a very dedicated, hard-working service. So my question to you is, are you taking advantage of these dedicated, hard-working people, given 44% said they don't want to remain in the service, given that um, if we look at adjournments, uh, and this is all going back to their workload that they say they've got, um, they've got, 40% um, don't want to remain in the service, 44% say their workload is unacceptable, it's 2% higher than the civil servant average, and adjournments, 
as we now know from the evidence taken by the cabinet from the cabinet secretary which he's now supplied in sheriff courts in summary sheriff courts then the adjournment from crown motions is increasing year on year and now stands at 8387 and in solemn cases um, it stands at 1,572, but three times as much as the adjournments requested from the defence. So it's quite a serious question. Are you listening and are you taking advantage of your very dedicated workforce, who I have to say have expressed some fear in coming to give evidence to this committee, but have not been short in their criticism? Perhaps I could say a few words and then, and then I'm sure the Crown Agent will want to say something. The first thing to say is I have been very clear and I continue to be very clear that the greatest resource of the service is its staff. And I'm um, not surprised to have seen the evidence that you've uh, received about the quality of the Crown staff. That, that's been my own view. It's a view that I've sought to reinforce um, repeatedly since I came into office. So um, uh, the committee should be under uh, no doubt of the value that I place uh, on the uh, staff uh, who uh, prosecute in my name and indeed all the staff uh, who uh, support them across the uh, service. Um, the uh, in the session that we had on the budget, I drew the committee's attention to the uh, most recent staff survey and I pointed out that um, the numbers in that survey are, I was pleased to see, moving in the right direction. Now, that's not to suggest that there aren't uh, challenges. Um, uh, that's not to suggest that there aren't, uh, 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 that there isn't a great deal of room for uh, improvement, but the numbers are, or on any view, uh, moving in the right direction. And on the particular issue of the desire of staff to remain in the service, it is encouraging to see that um, the proportion of staff who wish to stay in the service over the long run, that's three, uh, for more than three years, is very significantly higher than the civil service uh, average. Um, a key, a, key, a key feature of the service's response to the um, challenges which the staff face is the Fair Futures programme, which you, you've heard about and which the Crown Agent, I'm sure, can speak about in, in, in more detail. One of the purposes of which is to seek to address um, uh, 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 any issues around uh, the morale of staff. So, that, so I hope that sets in context um, my view uh, in relation to uh, the importance of the staff who uh, who um, perform the important public uh, functions that they do. Um, I, I you made a point, convener, about I, I, about adjournments um, uh, and the number of adjournments. Um, the uh, I can provide um, statistical information uh, about that. Perhaps the important point um, that, that, that I take from the data that I've been provided that if one's looking at the summary courts, 80% um, of the Crown motions to adjourn were as a result of the non-attendance of an essential witness, 80%. Um, now, that perhaps illustrates the, um, the challenge that we all face in the criminal justice system in uh, uh, um, operating a system which depends on everybody getting into the same room on the same day at the same time and being ready to go. Um, so 80% of Crown motions to adjourn and more in the summary courts are due to the absence of an essential witness, someone who has been cited to attend and fails to attend. That's part of the picture um, and part of the background for thinking seriously about whether we can deal with summary justice in a different way through significant procedural reform. And I, I, I do invite the committee, as I've invited them previously, to look at the part of the evidence and procedure review project with which the Crown is very fully engaged, which is seeking to um, uh, move forward uh, that agenda. That agenda, if we can get it right, will affect 
transformational change in the system, which will not only benefit members of the public who currently are inconvenienced um, uh, but, but by the way the system operates, but will also um, uh, alter the, the, the landscape within which um, prosecutors, defence agents and indeed all of us operate. It was specifically on the workload, um, that's why I mentioned the uh, journalists, there may be some reasons for them, but this, this um, staff feedback from 44%, 2% above the civil service average, saying they thought their workload was unacceptable. Of the Can I perhaps just add more generally, first of all, in relation to the letter before I come back to the point, I think um, in the question, convener, you raised um, uh, three points, an observation on the letter, which um, uh, reflects Mr Ross's comments, which I'd like to pick up on, if I may. Um, then there were issues about um, staffing position and then also in relation to adjournments, if I can, if I can seek to draw all those three uh, together. First of all, in relation to the letter, um, the intention with the letter was, was um, uh, multiple purposes. The first one um, a, is, um, first of all, to, I think in the second page of the letter, um, I highlight that um, far from um, Mr Ross's characterisation of, of, of not accepting that there's need for significant change, I think in the second page I highlight that actually there's a, there's a very, very strong argument for system change in its entirety. Um, and what um, I'm, I'm advocating and Lord Advocate uh, supports, and I think fair uh, evidence from others, is that, that part of a significant contributor to the difficulties that have been identified, not only by the committee, but by other professionals in the system relates to that system issue. And so that's the first thing is that there, there, there is a, a need and an opportunity for transformational change and I was trying to communicate that. So it's not about the same as before, it's about acknowledging the challenge and, and, and trying to approach that in a different way. The second um, purpose of the letter was to seek to try to provide a, a level of reassurance that many of the issues that the committee has heard evidence about were actually issues that um, they had been recognised and which work was ongoing. So, for example, in relation to the, the VIA review, in relation to the evidence and procedure review, in relation to the shaping the future, the fair futures, etc., all of those things um, are, are matters wh which are relevant to the evidence which the committee has heard and to the extent that it was possible to provide a level of reassurance to the committee about these were matters that had been identified and were matters that were already being taken seriously, that that, that was again a, a purpose of the letter. The third thing, um, a purpose of the letter, and, and, and perhaps these are the items that the convener has identified as the very goods, was to acknowledge that um, there have been matters that have been raised in evidence that were new matters that require a response. And I think there have been a number of those that I've reflected in the letter that, um, again, that was not to suggest that I wasn't uh, in the letter saying that we weren't responding to the other matters, but that I was highlighting that these were new matters. So these were matters that hadn't been previously identified as significant priorities, but which having heard the evidence, um, I completely accept that that remains the position and that those will, will require to be addressed. So that, that was the purpose in, in the letter. Um, and also the final purpose was where the, the committee has heard um, a, 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 some evidence that perhaps was not supported by data to seek to provide the data that, which is available uh, to um, a, both a COPFS and to the organisation as a whole, um, but also to the wider system to inform the committee and allow the committee to take a view on the, the weight of the evidence to be attached uh, to, that you've heard. So that was multiple purposes in the letter. Insofar as um, the, the, uh, the specific issues that have been raised are concerned, I think, uh, again, in, in my letter, um, I, I highlight, and for the avoidance of any doubt, I'm very happy to, to, to reconfirm before the committee. Our staff are our most valuable resource. There is no question whatsoever of seeking to take advantage of them. And I think you will see um, from the efforts that have been made to try and secure and maintain staff numbers against a challenging budget position, that I hope that you will recognise that there are significant steps that have been taken in trying to ensure that staff um, a, a, are, are a, a appropriately a, a resourced and, and, and supported. Um, and very happy to look at that in more detail as we go through the evidence in relation to how we've sought to approach that and how we'll try and meet the challenges in the future with that um, a, a, a mindset. Um, a, a, finally, in relation to the adjournments, um, Lord Advocate has indicated already that the 80% 
of, of the, the Crown adjournments relate to, to non-attendance of witnesses. These are members of the public who, for whatever reason, are choosing not to engage with the system as currently structured. These are members of the public where the system is having to chase them in order to uh, get them to cooperate, get them to, to contribute towards the justice system. And part of the reason for that is because um, they perhaps don't want to give evidence on that particular issue. Part of it feels that they don't particularly feel vested in the justice system as it's currently structured. And all of those matters, I would suggest, are matters that, that should be of concern to the broader system and including to this committee about how we can seek to move the conversation on about, for example, it's an issue if a member of the public does not attend a GP appointment. And that is a debate which has a level of public support in relation to the waste that that creates. That, that lost appointment impacts on that individual and that individual's health, but and impacts on the doctor who um, is, is otherwise um, uh, left with, with, a, with a vacant slot. If a member of the public fails to attend for trial, the inconvenience in contrast to the non-attendance at a GP appointment is to a far wider range of people because it's to every other witness who has bothered to turn up to give evidence on that day. It's to the court, it's to the accused who's left in a situation where the matter which requires to be determined by the justice system remains unresolved and has to be continued and that has left hanging over them. So as part of this, and as part of the, 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 the position in relation to the evidence and procedure review, there is a real opportunity and a willingness on the part of the system, um, supported um, and, and uh, driven by the court service, and, and driven initially, if you'll recall, by, by Lord Carloway's report, to look at these in a different way, to ask a different question about how the justice system operates, and to ask something different about the engagement of civilian witnesses in particular. And that conversation, and that's part of what I was trying to convey in the letter, is, from my perspective, the most significant one that we face. Let's not kid ourselves that there are significant issues in civilian cooperation with the current system. Let's improve it for them. A number of questions to get through and some supplementaries. Do you still have a supplementary, Stuart, or has it been answered? Yes. Yeah. I, I just wanted to pick up on what seems to be a very valuable source of evidence about how the, uh, the service is doing. And the Lord Advocates already opened up the uh, issue of the staff survey. And I wondered if the Lord Advocate thought that it was pretty good that there was an increase of 15 percentage points uh, in staff reporting an acceptable workload in 2016, there was an 11 percentage point increase in the number of staff who were suggesting they had a, an adequate work-life balance. And of course, in relation to the planning to stay figure, uh, the Lord of Advocate might have also said that that's 17 percentage points above the civil service average. Now, that's not the whole picture, of course, and doesn't remove uh, the proper need to identify further challenges, but it would suggest, is it not, Lord Advocate, that the staff themselves, in looking at the work that they are uh, facing, think things are, in some of the important aspects, moving in the right direction. Um, well, I'm grateful for, for, for the opportunity to turn to the survey because um, uh, I, I entirely agree with you that um, it, it, it's encouraging. The figures are moving in the right direction, not a basis at all for complacency because, uh, as, as, as we've already said, the service is, has recognised the need to um, engage uh, more fully with staff welfare through the Fair Futures uh, programme. On the specific issue of the um, plans of staff for the future, uh, and, and it is perhaps a point that I ought to make, given the question the convener asked me uh, a moment ago. Um, in the 2016 survey, 60% um, of staff stated that they wanted to stay working for the COPFS for at least the next three years. And that's 6% uh, up on the last survey, 17% higher than the civil service uh, average. Um, in the if I put it this way, the least favourable category, I want to leave COPFS as soon as possible. We have 8% of staff who report 
uh, uh, that that's down 5% from the previous survey and is 1% lower than the civil service average. Um, I would love all those staff to be uh, wanting to stay with the service for the, 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 for, for, for the next three years, but um, I, I do take from, for, for, from those figures that um, in terms of the commitment of staff to the work of the service, um, one can take um, comfort from, from them. Um, and against the, the background of those figures, I don't recognize the figure that the uh, convener um, put to me. I think it's a direct cor correlation, 40%. If 60% want to stay, 40% don't. <laughs> well, I, I think it's important to look at the, the options. The, the options are I want to leave as soon as possible. I want to leave within the next 12 months. I want to stay for at least the next year. 24% are in that category, and that's 3% up on last year. I want to stay working for COPFS for at least the next three years, 60%. So it's the, you're absolutely right, convener, that 40% uh, don't, uh, are not saying, I want to stay working for COPFS for at least the next three years. But of that 40%, 24% want to stay for at least a year. And th those two figures are are both up <laughs> and are both uh, uh, and, and, and in particular the, the, the top figure is significantly higher than the civil service average um, so uh, as I say without in, in any way wishing to um, um, suggest any level of complacency on this issue because we're not complacent about it um, uh, there is um, encouragement to be taken from, uh, from, from, from that survey and indeed from those particular figures Supplementary, Fulton, you still have one? Uh, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, you're asking if I still have one, actually. I would like to raise a procedural point first. That I've waited nearly uh, 25 minutes to get in for a supplementary. And members will know supplementaries, uh, the momentum can kind of go. There was actually two points I wanted to raise an issue with uh, Mr Ross. Um, when he mentioned about having contact with the Lord Advocate, I'd like to put on the record that I had to contact uh, the Lord Advocate's uh, office um, on one occasion and got a response uh, almost immediately. So um, to have that balance and put that on on, well. on record. Um, but the point I was going to do, and I do, I do accept that you know we're um, 15, 20 minutes uh, um, away from it. But Emperor, it's entirely at my discretion. Yes. I bring people in as supplementaries. Uh, this is going to be a very long evidence mm -hmm. session. If it's helpful to cover things at this point which are relevant, we'll do it. Well, do you have a relevant yeah, point? Yeah, well, I'll, t I'll take the opportunity still to ask my supplementary uh, convener. Thanks very much for, for giving me that. Um, it was about uh, Mr uh, Rossi's question about the the... the he doesn't see that the Lord Advocate and uh, Mr Harvey um, suggesting that there's any need for change. I think Mr Harvey's already went on to answer the question somewhat, um, but I wonder if, if either the Lord Advocate or Mr Harvey could expand in exactly what that might mean, some of the changes that might take place, what it might mean for people involved in the justice system. Um, you know, those, those accused and uh, witnesses, for example, possibly on the area of child witnesses, changes that might come there. Yes, um, I, 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 I'll make a couple of points which are really derived from the, the work that's been done on the evidence and procedure review. Um, the court service has produced a helpful um, table, and they're, they're very clear this is not a prediction. It's not a prediction, but it's an indication of the scope for uh, improvement. At, at the moment, um, 52,000 trials are set down in a given year. Of those, 9,000 trials run. Now, every time a trial is set down, all the witnesses have to be cited to attend. Um, and the court services um, document identifies approximately 460,000 witnesses cited to uh, summary trials. Um, now, um, if, we only ra if we only set down the trials that actually run, the 9,000 trials that run, um, we would be able to save 368,000 witness citations. Now, as I say, one has to be very clear that that's not a prediction being made by the court service, but it is an indication of the scope if we can get the procedures right in terms of not fixing cases, um, uh, not fixing trials uh, in cases that are not uh, uh, likely to run. It gives an indication of the scope that is uh, available within the system for effecting really a transformational change. 
Um, the other part of the evidence of procedure review is looking very closely at the way that we deal with children and other vulnerable witnesses. And there's a real focus there on seeking to um, uh, capture the evidence uh, at as early a stage as possible and in advance of trial. Um, I, I, in my former role when I was dean of faculty, we um, uh, held a conference uh, on um, uh, vulnerable witnesses and the approach that the system takes to vulnerable witnesses. And we had an address from Lord Judge, who was the former Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, who has spoken very eloquently um, uh, uh, to the point that in future years, people will look back and, and, and be, be uh, astonished that we um, put children into uh, the traditional court setting. So the ambition is to deal with ev the evidence of children and vulnerable witnesses in a different way. Um, children are, are the obvious um, uh, first uh, focus for that. Um, um, as I say, that's ongoing work, and I'd be wrong to prejudge where that will get to, but um, certainly I can say for my part, and um, I'm sure I can say on behalf of the Crown Office, that this is work that we are very actively engaged with, uh, along with other uh, parties in the justice system. Um, if I might just on the question of correspondence say that um, it, it'll be appreciated that every letter um, raises um, uh, its own issues and the, the uh, time that is taken to respond to it will um, reflect a range of uh, factors including the, the, the ease with which uh, the issue can be addressed. Um, That's very wide supplementary. Liam, do you still have a, a point on that? It was it, basically following on from the Crown Agents um, uh, letter. I, mean, I, I think it was helpful, um, Mr. Harvey, setting out the, the, the intention behind the letter. And I, I think, in the main, I found it useful. But I think um, the impression could be given that some of the evidence that we'd heard across a range of issues was, was in a sense, um, being dismissed. Now, leaving that aside, because I think you've given a, a, an explanation uh, for, the, for, for the purpose, whether it's in terms of the kind of um, pressure on staffing, staffing levels, um, whether it's around the central marking of cases and the impact that that's had, whether it's on prosecution policy. We've heard concerns raised, and they're raised by key stakeholders of the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. So I'm struggling to understand how the evidence that we've heard seems to be at odds, in, in a sense, with where um, you see current policy and practice resting. Amongst people who one would have thought are closely involved in the, in the reviews that you've set out that have, have been undertaken for some time now and, and are building towards perhaps addressing some of the concerns they were raising. So I'm struggling to understand why it is that there's this lag effect in terms of the evidence that they are giving us about concerns they believe are still relevant and live now and the, and, and the, the evidence that you're giving us that to some extent says, well, look, um, it's not as it's been portrayed uh, to you. These, these people clearly are either misrepresenting what is happening or are referring to something that is more historical uh, and, and not so relevant now. Um, I wouldn't seek to say that anyone is misrepresenting. Where data is available, I've sought to provide data. Mm. Um, and as I say, that enables uh, the committee to um, assess um, from their own perspective the, the, the true position um, um, as opposed to a perspective on that position. Um, insofar as the, the, the lag is concerned, I do think that is an interesting point um, because uh, on, 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 on taking up appointment um, and, and following the appointment of, of uh, the new law officers, there, there were a, a number of issues that um, uh, we sought to take forward. And I think in uh, previous discussions we have, we have we have uh, alluded to those and, and changes that, that we would like to, to, to make, um, uh, not only to uh, uh, the way in which COPFS approach uh, casework, but also uh, to the wider system. And I think that you are um, hopefully seeing in the letter that, that those um, uh, uh, matters are being taken forward and, and were being taken forward and to the extent that it was, that it was possible, as I said to you, one of the, the key points was to try and provide a level of reassurance mm -hmm. that matters that, that were uh, being raised as concerns to the committee were matters which had already been identified and which we were seeking to address. But so, for example, on the VIA review, um, that was work that was already ongoing, but the implementation of that isn't the flick of a switch and, and it's something that happens overnight. So it, these are to the, the reassurances, these are issues that, that have been recognised. 
reviews have been conducted or are being conducted, and, and thereafter we're, we, we would seek to, to implement the fruits of those reviews and, and would undertake to do so, and those reviews include the input from stakeholders. Well, I mean, at, at the very least, it, would, it tends to point to a, a perception issue amongst many of those stakeholders, mm. but the, the, the issues they feel are still mm. uh, relevant and, and in need of addressing. I think many of those who gave evidence were using um, live examples um, from, from uh, very, very recent uh, past to, uh, to, to, to illustrate Indeed. the points that they, they were making. So at the very least, it sounds like the, the data that you're providing for this committee is not necessarily data that you've been sharing with those who, as I think the Lord Advocate indicated, um, have been raised for, for some time directly with the Crown Office um, in, in other fora, which gives I think some cause for concern, I would say. Well, the, 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 the data is, is, is available and, and, and has been shared with, with, with stakeholders. Um, a, but, there, but I think that one of the advantages of, of this, if you don't, if, with respect in relation to the committee conducting uh, this inquiry, is that, that, that actually it does give an, a, an opportunity to, to engage through the committee with the wider public um, about the, the nature of the role of COPFS, the issues that the justice system faces, and the sharing of this kinds of information. Because there are um, a, a, some issues which were um, I would say slightly more historic. There were others that are definitely live issues, which, um, a, a, which you've heard examples of and which are matters that we're seeking to address. And as I said, there was a third category of matters where you, hit, we, you did hear evidence and we've learned from that. And I think I've, I've sought to highlight that in the letter. So, so, so for, for across that, 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 that full range of matters that were um, a, either slightly historic, matters that were new, um, but which we, we were, um, or live issues that we were seeking to address, and issues which were genuinely new, which we are, we will now take forward. It, I, I just thought, if we're possible, to try and, 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 and differentiate those and provide levels of reassurance about what was already ongoing, but also to, for the avoidance of any doubt, to provide a level of reassurance that the input from the, the inquiry and the other, the, the other evidence that we've had will form part of the considerations as part of those reviews as well, that, that it's not um, a, that simply we've reached our own view and, and we will then close the door and say that's that, that done. The, this, there's been valuable evidence that we will use. Um, so for example, on, on, on the case marking and on the communication side, um, on the, 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 the issues that were raised on, um, in relation to wildlife matters, etc. All of those, and I just use those examples, but there are many examples of, of things that have been raised that we will take forward a lot of supplementaries because the first opening questions have been very broad brush approach and, and looking at the inquiry and, and your response to it to date and this is our final evidence session. Mary, still in the supplementary and then we're into more detail with Oliver and Rona. Thank you, um, convener. And just for completeness on the matter of staff, Mr Harvey, I'd like to ask you about fixed term contracts of, of staff because you, you mentioned it briefly in your letter and you talk about the good progress that you've made in um, moving staff from fixed term contracts to permanent, moving staff that are on um, temporary promotions to permanent. But can I just ask you in relation to both legal and non-legal staff that are on fixed term contracts, do you see a point where you will have no staff on fixed term contracts? Um, the progress that you hope to make um, this year in relation to moving staff from fixed to permanent contracts, will that be all of the staff? And will some of the, ta the staff that are on fixed term contracts be caught up in the staff savings? Um, first of all, um, uh, the, the move uh, to uh, 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 more uh, permanent contracts as opposed to fixed term contracts, that was initially um, in relation to the, the, the legal staff. Mm -hmm. And I think we've provided some evidence in relation to, to, no, to what those numbers are, and that that that's, remains a continuing journey, and there will mm -hmm. be further work on that. Um, it's similarly in relation to the the non-legal staff, mm -hmm. which is the next phase in relation to that. There will be significant um, uh, numbers of, of of those individuals who will be appointed on permanent contracts. Um, it will not be them all, um, and uh, that's the rule. The rule, and I think I've, I've made reference in the letter to. Um, a continuing requirement for a, a proportion mm. of, of a, a, a short-term contracts, but it will be a significantly shorter, a smaller number of short-term contracts, mm. and it will be short-term contracts with, with a purpose as opposed to perhaps a, what has become 
um, uh, frankly, an, an all-too-commonplace um, uh, nature of appointment. And the third category that, that I mentioned, I think, previously in the last evidence session was the, the, the number of temporary promotions. Mm. Um, and again, I think that, that provided some evidence that that is currently sitting at over 100. It's too high. And I, as I mentioned in the previous um, uh, session, that has a number of, 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 of very obvious consequences in relation to uncertainty for individuals, uncertainty for teams, issues in relation to training, loss of expertise, etc., all of which um, I, I fully accept. And, and those are the, the motivators for for, for changing the approach to that, and there will be uh, significant changes in relation to the, the non-legal staff and the proportions um, in the coming weeks and months. And I would certainly hope to be in a position where, where that would have been subject to, to quite significant change at or around the start of the, the new financial year. But it will not be the case that it will be absolutely all. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Just for the avoidance of doubt, is it the case that in 2009 um, there were 558 full-time equivalent prosecutors and as of October 2016 there are now 24 less, 534? That's correct. For December 2009 was the, 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 the all-time high um, in, in terms of, of legal staff for that one month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's quite a telling figure in itself, but we will probably go on to that later. Oliver? Oh, thank you, convener. I'm probably still sticking with questions that are a little bit too general, but I mean, I accept the points you've made in relation to the data in the letter, but would you also accept that sort of behind that, I mean, the data is just one part of the picture and that where people have perceptions and impressions relating to shortcomings around the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, that does sort of affect the integrity of the system as a whole. And, you know, is it not worrying uh, that a number of witnesses are sort of lacking confidence, perhaps, in, in where things are, at least at the moment? I think it's a couple of points. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, the, first, the, the, the first point is, p plainly, um, if... Um, important stakeholders have, have, a, ha, have a poor impression of the service, that's a matter of concern um, and something that the service ought to seek to address. And uh, I, I, I think I've sought to reassure the committee that we are seeking to address the, the, the real challenges which face the, 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 the service. Um, I suppose the second point is to, to, to say that um, it is important where there is data, to look at the data and to assess as objectively as one can what the position is. is. Um, and the third point to make is um, to, to pick up on your word, confidence. I hope, uh, I, I recognise immediately that there are a, a whole range of um, perceptions um, about, of the service of which you've had evidence, um, issues to do with communication. Um, issues uh, in relation to the way particular victims have uh, been in, 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 engaged with by the service. Um, I think it's important to, um, uh, to make this point that I do not detect um, uh, and I hope there is no lack of confidence in the uh, robustness of the fundamental fundamental work that the prosecution service does, which is the um, effective, rigorous, fair and independent prosecution of crime. And if there were um, any want of confidence on, 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 on that issue, um, then I think it would be important to go to the data and to look at the data which um, um, uh, 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 was published today, which indicates that um, uh, uh, of the cases that are prosecuted, a conviction is brought in in over 80%. There's a not guilty verdict in 6%, um, a not proven verdict in 1%, and um, there's, a, a, there's a, a, a balance in which cases are discontinued. Those kinds of figures would suggest that the decision making, uh, first of all, is robust, uh, and secondly, that the um, the fundamental work of prosecuting cases before our courts is being done effectively by the service. That's the, the you know, and the public ought to have confidence that um, the service is an effective, rigorous, fair and independent prosecutor. 
I accept entirely that you've heard evidence about important parts of the engagement of the service with the wider community. But that, I think one shouldn't lose sight of, is the fundamental, fundamental public responsibility which I have and which the service has. You know, I, I, I do accept that. I just want to come back on the first point. So you would accept that, from what we've heard from witnesses, there are key stakeholders who do have significant concerns about important aspects of, of your work? Um, you've heard the evidence. I've read the evidence. I don't think that could be, uh, could, could be disputed. Thank you. Because um, I, I, I think the public confidence is key. And uh, listening to uh, the remarks from the Crown agent earlier, uh, around how uh, willing witnesses are to engage uh, with the service, their likelihood to turn up, uh, the, the amount of importance that people attach to being cited as a witness in a case. I mean, I, th I think that is a worrying example of, of where people don't feel uh, that it's necessarily worthwhile engaging. And I note from page 10 of the letter, you say, as prosecutors, we can only do our job if victims and witnesses are willing to come forward and give evidence. Indeed. And I think some of the things that we've heard, particularly, I think, more around a culture uh, within the Crown Office, means that people don't necessarily believe uh, that they're, they're going to get the very best uh, justice that they can. And I think, the, you know, the numbers are strong in terms of prosecutions, but there are a lot of people uh, who still feel that, that justice for them has, hasn't been done. I think it, it, there's, there's a distinction to be drawn in relation to the, the, the service contribution to that issue and the wider system issue as well. And I think that the, the, the point I would make is that these are people who are not engaging with the system and there are a number of reasons for that, part of which might lie at the door of COPFS and part of which might lie elsewhere, particularly in relation to some fundamental structural issues about how we conduct our business, how, how we try to um, a choreograph, for want of a better phrase, um, the attendance of so many individuals at a particular location at a particular time in order to, to, to progress a trial. And I think that, as, as um, Lord Advocate has indicated, the evidence in procedure review and indeed the examination of other systems suggest that there are alternate and, frankly, better ways of, of, of securing the, the, the cooperation and the key inputs from members of the public uh, to the justice system. Um, insofar as uh, the, the data is concerned, you have heard evidence um, from um, uh, individuals and from stakeholders in relation to uh, particular uh, failures, for want of a better phrase, in service provision, um, which um, I think, again, in the letter I've said that, that um, it, I, we, we accept and, and, and regret and, and we would seek to learn from. Um, and, and as I said in the previously, insofar as any reviews are ongoing or indeed any new uh, activity is required, that evidence will be key. But in relation to the data in matters such as that, that was to set by way of context, for example, in relation to the numbers of, of victims and witnesses that we are dealing with, to, to, to set a sense of perspective about the, the nature of the service complaints and that, the, frankly, the vast majority um, of, of individuals who are engaging with VIA on a daily basis are provided with a good service, but that is not as to say that there aren't individuals, um, a, and, and there have been a number of, of, of good examples um, of, of, of individuals who haven't had the standard of service that either um, I, as, as, as um, a, a head of that service, would expect, or indeed as the individuals who are categorised as, as, as dealing with them would themselves expect to be able to provide. And so, again, that, that's a learning point, but the data is to set the context of the, the numbers of interactions, as I say, the vast majority of which are positive. Well, I wonder if I could just pick up on the, 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 the quotation that you've taken about the importance of um, victims, um, the confidence of victims um, in, 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 in the system. Um, as prosecutors, we can only do our job of 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 of, of um, bringing criminals to justice if victims come forward speak up are willing and enabled to give evidence effectively in the system so that's part of um, you know, part of what we need to do as prosecutors um, I think you'll if you look at the um, the former Solicitor General's um, review, you will see how far we have come in actually a remarkably short time in the way that we deal with victims. I mean, we're really 
it, you know, it really started um, as recently as 2000. And you know, within my professional lifetime, um, we had a criminal justice system which really paid no regard to the special needs um, uh, and particular importance of, of victims within the system. So we've come uh, on a, a remarkable distance in, in the scale of things, uh, a remarkably short period of time. And I've no doubt that the commitment of the COPFS and the commitment of law officers to um, to dealing appropriately with the victims of crime has has greatly enhance the confidence of victims in coming forward. Um, it is one of the reasons why uh, we now, um, uh, for, 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 for the change in the prosecution of sexual offending, um, victims are, have more confidence in the system. We would like them to have uh, still more confidence in the system and, and, and we think that the way forward is, has been signposted by uh, Leslie Thompson in, in her review. But um, uh, I, I think the point you make is a really important one about the need for, need for us to, to give <coughs> victims the confidence to come forward, to speak up and um, to give evidence. No, I, I, I appreciate uh, that answer. I mean, I think one of the most difficult things for me as a member of this committee uh, was one of our early sessions where we met with uh, some, some victims of, of crime who, who talked us through their own experience. And I think it's very hard, you know, even though it's, you know, we, we maybe spoke to, I think, three people uh, in total, but, you know, the impression that we got from those witnesses, uh, victims, sorry, wasn't, you know, that, that things had been good for them. Uh, and I think Victim Support Scotland in their own submission you know, had, had some questions over how things operated in practice and I think they welcomed you know, a lot of the directives that were coming from the top of the organisation but were saying that really on a day-to-day -day basis that for a lot of people things haven't changed at all and that they're not being given enough time uh, to, to do their work uh, to, to get people ready for, for their day in court uh, and that you know, people are in, put in a position where they're coming into contact with the accused uh, on the way into the courtroom, uh, that uh, you know, a, lot, a lot of the good practices is, is sort of starting to come through the system, but it's not there for people on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and I just hope that that's a point you sort of take forward. I, I wonder if I might intervene. I'm conscious that, that perhaps that there hasn't been sufficient time for you to consider the, the, the Thompson review in, yep. in, in, in detail. But I think it, it, it makes a number of points on, on those very issues. And I think there, 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 there were undoubtedly, as I said already and have accepted, there were, there were service issues there about uh, where, where there were um, specific points where, where um, you heard evidence um, uh, from those witnesses that fell below the standards we would accept in, in, or expect in relation to the responsibilities of VIA. There were also other parts of it which were interesting from the point of view of, of a misunderstanding on the perspective of those witnesses about the role of what, of what we were ever intended to do. Um, and, and also um, uh, some misunderstandings, I think, for example, in relation to the role of the prosecutor. I think it was reference to my lawyer, um, etc., which again um, are matters that um, a, we need to, to, to learn and take cognizance of and make absolutely clear to those that we're engaging with what they can reasonably expect from not only from via support but also the role of the prosecution in the system in Scotland um, so that it's, that it's clearer for them. But that's not to say though that, that there isn't, as I've highlighted in the letter and I think is also highlighted in the Thompson report, a legitimate expectation on the part of victims to, to have more support consistently than they are currently get receiving. Um, but whether or not that's a matter which could or should be provided by the prosecutor and um, therefore via, or whether or not there are separate issues about how that, that level of appropriate support might best be provided is a legitimate debate that I think is opened up uh, by the, the, the Thompson report. And again, which in, in, in due course, I would welcome um, a, a, the, the significant and, and, and robust views of the committee in relation to their thoughts on, on, on how that might be progressed. Because it comes back to these fundamental questions about how we ensure that regardless of whether or not you're a victim, a witness or an accused person in the criminal process, that the system collectively finds a way of supporting you to give of your best in order to secure justice. And um, as, as things stand in relation to some of the role, the, the, the service delivery in relation to VIA, 
Most, the vast majority of it is excellent, but there have been service issues, which we accept. But there are also issues in relation to the patchwork provision of other support across the country, how VIA then engage with that, um, and whether or not the totality of that support in certain locations is sufficient and meets the expectations of legitimate expectations of, of victims and witnesses um, in the 21st century. And I think that that is um, a, a matter of a, a legitimate debate and, and concern uh, for the, the, the transformation of the justice system that I've alluded to in my letter. Two damages. supplementaries on this, if that's on Mary and then Mary. Thank you, Convener. Um, ju just very briefly, <coughs> one of the points that came out in the evidence session that my group had with the victims and witnesses was that the service isn't proactive enough in, in reaching out. Uh, victims and witnesses are notified um, by letter this service is available, but it's up to them to reach forward or, or reach out to the service and not the other way around. Now, I've not had an opportunity to look at the Thompson Review, but I just wondered if that was something that you would be looking at in the way you take forward the service. Uh, and I know you can't have a one-size-fits-all and you can't reach out to everybody because of the, the resources involved, but if there is some way of being more proactively involved, particularly with vulnerable witnesses. But perhaps I can make a, a comment um, in response to that and then let, let the Crown agent um, uh, re respond. Um, it, it perhaps does come back to the point the Crown agent was alluding to um, uh, about what the role of the victim support provided by the prosecutor uh, is. Um, it's entirely right that we provide information and we should be providing accurate and timeless information. Um, it's entirely right that we administer the arrangements for special measures which help uh, victims and other vulnerable witnesses to, to give their evidence. And it's entirely right that we uh, uh, um, uh, 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 provide a, 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 a point of contact within the prosecution system which helps to, hopefully helps um, victims to um, in the ideal world feel that um, they can engage appropriately with the system um, and it's entirely appropriate that we where we can uh, uh, signpost people to other services that may be available but it we, we are, we're, we're not a counseling service um, we're not an advocacy service in terms of, of, of pr providing advocacy advocacy support with a little a for for, 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 for victims um, and, and the work that we do which is um, important and significant work in in seeking to support victims um, um, is work that we do in the context of our fundamental responsibility as prosecutors uh, and that's really why the, uh, 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 the, the the key point that I think um, I, I take from the Thompson review um, which is that um, we need to look in a much more um, system-wide way at the, the needs that victims have and to start from that and to identify who within the system is the right person to provide uh, different services and to try and deliver those services in a much more effective way. Now, um, uh, th that, that's a sort of uh, high-level uh, response and the Crown Agent may wish to say something on the specific issue. There, there, are, there are two aspects. So first of all, in terms of the, 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 the approach that was, that was legislated for by Parliament and following the EU directive, the first, the first thing is that, that um, a, the identification of, of those who, who might be uh, suitable for VIA support is, is um, largely driven by crime type. And um, there's a question in the Thompson review about whether that's the appropriate position. I mean, it's a def so therefore, if, if I'm a, the victim of a housebreaking, um, do I need via support? Um, if, um, if, on the other hand, um, a, my, a, my grandmother, who's still alive, um, is the victim of a housebreaking, I would fully expect that she would um, um, benefit from VIA support, but as things stand at the moment, 
um, the approach will be that we will both be offered um, uh, that information and advice because of the nature of the crime type. Um, then the separate thing is in relation to the special measures, which um, identifies uh, those who are, who are deemed vulnerable. Now, that has, has benefits insofar as it, it, in a way, it simplifies a process, albeit it could be simpler still, and that's alluded to in the letter, in relation to categories of individual, whether by age or, or otherwise, um, who, who are therefore deemed um, uh, suited for special measures. Um, but that doesn't then seek to then um, identify whether that individual thinks that it's appropriate that they should have those special measures. And so that is one of the things that's picked out by the Thompson uh, uh, Review as, as a question mark, whether or not the, the, those services should be more appropriately targeted to those who are identified as, as vulnerable and therefore requiring of support, as opposed to you have been a victim of this particular crime type and therefore you require this level of support or you are this particular age and you require this uh, uh, level of support. There are some individuals who fall within the categories who are candidly quite indignant um, about the suggestion that they need special measures and support. Um, and, but that, that is the approach of the, the, the current legislative framework. Annie? Yeah, identical point to the point that Mary just raised there because of, from speaking to some of the, uh, the victims of crime that was one thing that became apparent because I think that you know you suffer this trauma whatever that might be and then you're thrust into this situation and it just seemed like there's so many organisations you, you don't know your way specifically through that and essentially what you need is some kind of one stop shop for somebody to, to guide you and to tell you right what's going to happen from here these are the different people that will contact you so you can and I, you know I think if hopefully I'm never in that position but you just think that you know if that was to happen to me that's what I would hope for, hope for and what I would expect and just to touch on a point that Oliver made uh, earlier as well just about even the uh, in the court setting itself in terms of uh, victims of crime coming into to contact with perpetrators I mean is that something that you see uh, uh, as your role to try and tackle I know that obviously the the, the setup of the courts and some of the buildings that are in that that can be quite hard to achieve but is that something that you're also looking at well I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very grateful for your first remarks because it chimes exactly with the um, recommendations of Leslie Thompson um, um, uh, the other bit of work of course that's been done in relation to victims um, it, it, it is um, the vulnerable witness part of the evidence and procedure review in which we're looking um, uh, as a system at the way that um, children and other vulnerable witnesses are um, dealt with by the system in a much more uh, in a much more general sense and we're looking at different ways of of um, approaching the taking of evidence um, I should say that one shouldn't underestimate that the um, process of giving evidence and the evidence um, being tested uh, as it may have to be tested um, entirely properly um, uh, is a very difficult one for many uh, many uh, vulnerable witnesses and victims of crime and it's entirely right that as a system we look at what can be done to um, allow that to be that process to take place in a, a, a way that um, um, doesn't, uh, so far as possible, re-traumatise or uh, exacerbate the impact of the original, um, the, the, the original crime itself. Um, issues about court buildings, I'm afraid, are matters for the for the for the court service. Um, there is a the, the, in, in terms of the the trial process, the accused is of course entitled to be present um, uh, throughout the trial. Um, special measures um, will allow a victim to give evidence um, when special measures are available in a way which either shields the perpetrator uh, 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 from the victim or, or, or indeed um, it may involve evidence being given from a, a, a remote site by CCTV. So there are mechanisms that are available. Um, um, there are of course, there are court buildings. Um, we, we deal with court buildings, and in, a, in, in the context of a, 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 a case, um, uh, uh, victims may well encounter uh, the, 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 the accused um, in, 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 in the context of those buildings. And I think you mentioned one-stop shop. And just the, 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 um, the Thompson uh, report uh, talks in terms of, of a, um, 
a one front door. Um, in other words, from the, the, the individual's perspective, they have one point of access and therefore thereafter collective services, multidisciplinary services thereafter respond um, according to the need and that's, that's the, 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 the model that is, that is proposed or the principle that is, is proposed in, and thereafter invited to, to, to seek to develop a model. If it, if it assists um, the committee, um, the, the Thompson report is on uh, the Justice Board agenda um, uh, for this week. That's helpful. I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever of the sincerity and the commitment of the government and the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service to ensure that victims do have a good experience and the best experience in court. However, going back to the evidence that we all heard from um, serious assault rape victims, then there were problems with communication. That's identified in the Thompson report, but it's more or less looked at as between agencies this was much more fundamental problems. It was as fundamental as via giving out misinformation about the verdict that had been arrived. It was the victims being given misinformation at every stage of the process or no information. So I very much welcome your commitment to work with this, but equally I hope you, you do take on board there's a fundamental problem there, it would seem, and I particularly welcome too in the Crown Agent's uh, response this commitment to look at language, less le legalistic communication so that um, victims and witnesses both understand exactly what uh, is being asked of them when they get communication from court. They're not fully engaged, and, and, and I think that, that's, that's, that, that stands to reason. And, and again, the, the, just to go back, there are, there are undoubtedly, um, you've, you've heard evidence of examples where, as I say, the service has not been of the standard it was accepted um, and, and would be expected. Um, it, those are, I, I would suggest, the exception rather than the rule, but the, the mere fact that they are the exception and they are so significant um, is, is, is worthy of significant um, uh, reflection and, 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 and uh, further work, and I fully accept that. I think if we put it another way, um, certainly the person that some of us met said, if you ask me, would I do it all again? Absolutely not. And given your opening statement, you know, if the criminal justice system and the court, um, the Crown Procurator Fiscal Service is to work, all the players need to be you know, keen and um, have confidence Indeed. in the system. So hopefully if we, we um, had this interview again, they would say, absolutely, you know, my experience was good and that's what we're all aiming for. Right, we've still got Ben and we've still got Rona. I'm wondering, take a break or do you want to just go on at this point? Let's go on and get Rona and Ben and see where we get to with that and perhaps about half 11 we can take a break and regroup. Okay, thank, thank you, Convener. Yes, I wanted to ask about an issue that we've uh, discussed several times during the inquiry, but I just wanted some clarification from you on it, and that's centralised case marking. Can you sort of um, clarify whether it was brought in as a sort of cost-saving exercise, um, if you think it's been successful, and, you know, bearing in mind we've heard concerns about the, you know, the, the local uh, knowledge being lost, etc. Um, so I wonder if you could just outline the position on that and where we are with it now. Yes, um, uh, and that's perhaps a, a, an example of, a, of, of um, a, an issue that's been raised. It's picking up on the point that Mr. MacArthur made earlier, where um, there are clearly different views about the advantages and disadvantages and where the balance of advantage lies. Um, for, for, from my perspective, um, as the um, head of the system of prosecution for the whole of Scotland, um, a national service ought to be applying um, consistent national standards to the decision-making that we make um, across the country. And one of the benefits of a national case-marking approach um, at the level of principle uh, is that it um, uh, allows um, dedicated teams um, who work together to do this particular task consistently to develop an expertise and a skill uh, and a level of consistency across uh, the whole system. Um, they're organized um, into, um, uh, uh, they're organized by reference to sheriffdoms 
um, so that although they are physically located in the national case marking um, uh, service at two, uh, at two, 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 two locations, um, you have teams who are in effect servicing the particular sheriffdoms and who can therefore build up a level of, of, of knowledge of, of, of those particular sheriffdoms. Um, the system uh, can accommodate particular matters that are of concern in particular local areas and indeed the police may um, in their reports identify a particular issue as being a particular matter of concern and um, if I put it this way um, um, we can secure that or through having a national approach we can ensure that where there is justification for a particular variation from the norm to be uh, uh, applied in a particular locality, that that itself is done consistently um, uh, and doesn't depend on the particular views of a particular individual in a particular uh, local area. Um, I think there's a separate issue which is about um, uh, uh, knowledge of, of local diversion schemes. Um, and uh, again, there's perhaps a stepping back and as the head of the, as the, head of the service, um, um, uh, one of uh, an issue which I've, I've reflected on um, uh, in light of that evidence is um, a, a degree of um, well, I think it's a question for, for, for that the committee might be interested to consider, which is uh, whether it's satisfactory that we don't have a consistency across the country in terms of, of the availability of diversion schemes. Um, now, in terms of national case marking. Again, the system is able to make sure that um, the uh, staff who are in that um, particular part of the service know, have information about what is available in particular areas. Um, there's perhaps, though, a, a more fundamental question, which is actually, shouldn't there be a consistency of availability across Scotland? Um, is it actually right that, um, uh, and I pose this as a question rather than um, uh, 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 particularly inviting an answer. Um, is it actually right that um, uh, 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 the decision to prosecute or to adopt a diversion scheme um, uh, uh, may depend on the particular locality that you, 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 you live in? There are a series of questions uh, about that, but I think the key point in terms of the national case marking uh, is that it, um, um, is able to provide relevant information to those who are making the decisions about the position in particular areas. Um, and um, so, so ought to be able to accommodate the, the, the concerns that have been raised. Crown agent can perhaps uh, add to, to, to that. Again, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but there are, there are a few points I need to touch on. Um, first of all, again, um, this, this has not been a, a, a process which has, which has happened um, overnight. It has been, I think, as I said in the previous evidence session, um, many years um, uh, since um, a, a, every local case was marked by the local procurator fiscal, and we could count that in, in decades rather than simply uh, years. And um, in a variety of, of different uh, structures that there have been in COPFS um, uh, over over recent years, um, it has been the case that the, the cases have been marked um, a, in either in hubs or um, because of the advantages that we have of our electronic systems, they've been portable and transferable and so therefore when capacity has been made available in a particular location, cases have been transferred over. So long before this, uh, for example, um, uh, deputies in Dundee, just as an example, may have been um, uh, uh, marking uh, cases where the offending uh, took place in, in Inverness. So to that extent, the, 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 the issue of, of the locality um, is, is not a new one. The second thing is that um, prior to this model, marking staff were not ring-fenced. And that led to, to, to all sorts of, of issues arising in relation to, to their time uh, being called upon to, for example, go into court. Um, and, and that did mean that for, in particular locations, um, a, a significant backlogs were developing um, because individuals were going into court. Um, and so therefore this was again uh, one of the reasons uh, for dealing with that because of, of the abstractions. Um, 
The other point with this was that, um, again, in, in particularly in relation to custody cases, but, but just marking generally, um, be, when, when the marking caseload was, was, was spread across um, a, a, a wide range of, of deputies, not just um, a ring fence staff, that meant that that was a, another, another duty that they had to perform when they might, for example, have been going into court. So again, you've heard evidence in relation to court preparation time. If you free up the other staff are ring fenced and you're not having to mark cases before you go in to do your trials court, then you can focus more on your trials court. So it's had that advantage. Um, in relation to um, the, the provision of, of, of training in relation to, to, to new developments, not only in legislation, but also in, in changes to uh, prosecution policy. And again, you've heard evidence, and we may touch on um, the pro prosecution policy review. It enables you to, to target a smaller number of staff with intensive training to make sure that you get your policies um, uh, consistently uh, in place and thereafter implemented. It's also been a model that has enabled us to learn and adapt um, it's not set in stone, so Lord Advocate has already alluded to the reference to being divided into um, a sheriffdom model to allow that level of, 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 of local contact and local understanding. That wasn't in the original proposal. That has been something that, that post uh, the changes um, uh, to our structure where we moved to the, the local court model with the sheriffdoms in April of last year that has something that seemed like the next logical step in order to create those connections. Um, and... and um, I suppose the other thing, just by way of context uh, with this, is that um, when one analyses the, 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 the crime types um, across the country, I think we've had some evidence about what the 10 um, most commonly um, uh, uh, committed offences are. They are broadly similar across the country. Um, there aren't significant variations in the nature of the criminality that is, is most common in, in, in different um, uh, parts. And the other thing that I think is important um, is to, to, to highlight um, the difficulties that there were with previous models. In some locations, and you, you, know, you, you may recall reading in the press at the time, indeed you may have had, um, depending on previous rules, some knowledge or experience of it, having um, uh, perhaps been on, on previous committees, where you'll have, heard, you'll have heard evidence or been aware from press reporting of custody courts classically in Glasgow still running at 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. That doesn't happen now. Um, and... So the, the, the new models um, have um, enabled us to, 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 to deal with the work in, in frankly, um, a, a more professional manner um, and a more consistent manner and in a way which ensures that we are, um, certainly from the feedback that we've had thus far, able to, to service the custody courts across the country in, in a successful manner. But that's not to say the model is set in stone and evidence that you've heard from, from others and indeed other learning. Uh, for example, in relation to the change to the sheriff the model, we'll, we will continue to, 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 to review and revise that model. Thank you. Just, just very briefly, has it saved money, just as an aside? <laughs> um, it, it, in the sense that it has saved um, a court time, um, a, it will have. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you. A supplementary, is Oliver, then, Liam? <clears throat> um, I... I, I except that there are some aspects of the central marking system that have brought about benefits. Uh, but would you acknowledge that you know, perhaps sort of taking marking away from local fiscals has fed into this sort of narrative that fiscals based locally have less and less uh, discretion, less ownership over cases. They're having to follow uh, sort of more centralised policies and that that does have again, an effect on just people's perception of how local justice is to them. Yes. Um, I think there's perhaps an important point, um, and it's, it, 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 it's perhaps a, a constitutional point, um, ultimately. Um, um, I, I, am, I am the head of the prosecution service, and in fact, I am the prosecutor in all solemn cases. And indeed, um, in, and in summary cases, it's always been the case that fiscals have um, acted within instructions and guidelines given to them by the Lord Advocate. Um, and one of the reasons for that is to make sure that um, there is a consistency in the way that the prosecution service um, operates um, uh, uh, across uh, the country. Um, um, 
Baron Hume, who's our greatest writer on criminal law in the 19th century, um, said that my, my role as Her Majesty's advocate is to vindicate Her Majesty's interest in the due and equal distribution of criminal justice to all her subjects. Um, and the way that I secure that constitutional obligation is by setting prosecution policy. Um, so uh, I think it's important um, in, in relation to this debate to recognise that consistency of approach across the country is part of making sure that all Her Majesty's subjects in Scotland have the equal protection of the, the criminal law and that there's a consistency of approach in similar cases across the country. Um, there's a, a, a separate issue which is about the, um, the trust and confidence which I have and I certainly have in those who prosecute in my name to exercise judgment and to make realistic and robust decisions within the policies which I set. And um, I've been very clear from, I think, the first day I was appointed um, that um, I have um, absolute trust uh, and confidence in the judgment of those who prosecute on my behalf um, up and down up and down the country. Um, I recognise that there has been a perception of uh, withdrawal of discretion uh, from uh, from fiscals. Now, I think it's important to put that in context. Um, um, the background the background uh, was a system in which. Um, decision-making in relation to individual cases um, uh, might, across the country, be significantly affected by the particular views of, of individual fiscals um, uh, 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 on issues that essentially uh, one might regard as matters of policy. And so there was a, 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 an entirely appropriate uh, shift to a, 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 a much greater commitment uh, to... Um, or clarity around the need for national policies within which um, all prosecutors are expected to operate. Um, if it were necessary to do so, I've been make, sending clear signals that um, within, within my policies, I'm, uh, I expect prosecutors to exercise their judgment. It's, 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 it's the privilege and also the burden and responsibility of being a prosecutor to that in the second session, but if we could Act keep in the marking. Yeah, um, it, yes. do you think that the changes to the case marking system have contributed to a perception amongst fiscals that their role has, within the service has been downgraded on a sort of local level? Well, and I, they have I, less ownership yes. over prosecution policy. I, 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 can't, I, can't speak to, uh, um, I can't I can't I can't speak directly to the perception that people have, but certainly I would want to make very clear um, that there is no downgrading of the, the role and, and responsibility of fiscals um, in, in my mind. And, and if I may just follow up with that. Very briefly, Convener, I go, I go back to the point that, that it's been decades since every local case was marked locally. And so the, 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 the point is that, that um, there's a, there, there can and should be a sense of collective ownership about, um, about the, the decision making. And, and two very, very brief points on that. Um, going back to the point of the lag and the perception in relation to certain issues that have arisen and whether or not they are, they are being addressed. Um, one of the, the issues I think that, that, that came out in the prosecution policy review wasn't so much about the policies themselves, but the approval levels in relation to the ability of the local deputy to make decisions. Um, and as part of that prosecution policy review, a significant number of those approval levels have actually been removed in their entirety and anything that has um, it remained as requiring her approval has been tested and has been um, a, a, the, the grade of, for that approval has been reduced to a local level. So again, that is something that has changed literally within the last few months in order to, to, to create that sense of local decision making and, and for the avoidance of any doubt to re-emphasise the point that Lord Advocate is making on trust and confidence by specific reference to the policies. And, and very briefly, going back to the materials that were published today in the Statistical Bulletin, um, the Lord Advocate made reference to the conviction rate the, and, and the acquittal rate where, where it's not guilty, not proven. A key point is that the 8% of the cases that we start 
we don't proceed with at a particular point where an either a not guilty plea is accepted or we choose um, to, to, to not continue with the proceedings and, and desert those proceedings. That is, I would respectfully submit, local discretion in action. I, I think there are still some bigger concerns around that. And we heard from Derek Ogg, QC, who was himself, I think, a former uh, deputy. Uh, and he's saying that you know sometimes it's a bit like an arrow leaving a bow. Uh, once someone has made a decision somewhere, no one wants to interfere with the decision, and it just rattles down the track, sometimes ending up in court by accident rather than design. So is that an, an analysis that you would just not accept at all? You think you've got the balance right? You want to um, relation to domestic abuse? And, uh, there, uh, certainly speaking, speaking um, uh, as it were, across the system, I think the, 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 the Crown agents um, al already referred to the, the, the evidence, the data, that shows that cases are discontinued. 8% of cases are discontinued. Um, now, that, obvious, that, 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 that will have been for a number of reasons, but um, one would um, surmise that a proportion of those are cases where um, new information has come to light, new material, has, new evidence has, has arisen, and a decision has been made that it's either uh, 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 no longer possible or no longer in the public interest to continue with the prosecution. Um, so there's evidence of, of discontinuation. Um, if it assists as, as well, the, 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 um, the, the discontinuation policy and the need to, to reinvigorate that discontinuation policy is a matter that has been the subject of, of discussion with, with, with ministers. And um, I would anticipate that it's certainly something that the, the, the service would wish is, 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 a, is a refresh and a relaunch of that discontinuation policy so that it's, that it's, it's um, absolutely apparent um, a, what the expectation is um, on, on individual members of staff and, and the, the trust that we have in them to, to, to meet that expectation. And, and uh, perhaps just for the avoidance of doubt, when the Crown agent uses the term ministers, he means myself and the Solicitor General. Liam, supplementary. Yeah, thanks very much. Can I firstly welcome the, the point Mr Harvey's made in, in relation to um, the approvals? Because I think you're right, that was a, 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 a focus of the early evidence we, we took. Nevertheless, the, the, the insistence on the importance of consistency, while I recognise, um, does rather ignore the point that um, those markings were taking place um, uh, historically uh, under guidance that was set centrally and therefore presumably secured a degree of consistency uh, across the piece. Uh, and that where if you're focusing your efforts on um, building up the skill levels of those in, in, in those two locations in a, in a central pool, um, is there not a risk that what you do is you you um, you extend the, the gap between um, the knowledge of those in the central marking pool and those who are then taking forward prosecutions at a, at a local level, that their understanding of the latest developments in policy and law um, may not be, or may be a far cry from, from what it is that uh, those centrally have? Uh, forgive me if, I, if, if I've un, you know, unintentionally misled the committee in relation to the way in which we operate our training. It, the, the, the NICP creates the opportunity of here's your first targeted audience for your training. Um, but, for example, the most, the most recent um, uh, changes in our policies under the prosecution policy review, the entirety of the staff have received that training. Um, and as of today, um, I think I'm right in saying that that, 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 that uh, training is now concluded. So it's, it's, it gives you an opportunity to... Um, a, 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 a focus um, a, the, the initial part of the training um, on, a, on a targeted group of individuals, but then that training is then provided to others because I think it's an absolutely key point that regardless of whether or not you're involved in the initial decision um, to, to raise proceedings or whether or not you're the, the, the deputy with the responsibility of the case at the very end when you're getting to trial, the obligation to keep revisiting the, the nature and strength of the Crown case continues. And I think that, again, that is reflected on, you know, the point I was raising earlier about the statistics where 8% are actually discontinued. In 8% of cases, whether that's because 
um, uh, key witnesses have regrettably, for reasons that we've spoken about already, failed to engage, or whether that's because of representations and evidence provided by the defence that was not previously available. Prosecutors are making decisions in 8% of cases that actually they are not going to continue with the prosecution. Mm -hmm. And so therefore that continuing obligation that they have, they're demonstrating that they are meeting that continuing obligation. That's not to say that you haven't heard evidence, which I fully accept, that greater clarity in relation to that um, obligation and also greater confidence um, from the staff members and being able to exercise uh, that, that, that um, uh, discretion is, is, is not something that would, would be of benefit. And that's why I'm saying that, that in particular, the, the discontinuation policy, which um, uh, uh, Lord Advocate will confirm, was, was, was one of the first items in the agenda when we had the discussion following his appointment, will be, will be key in ensuring that, that there is that trust and confidence on the part of the individuals who are making those decisions, that when they take a professional judgment on that continuing obligation basis to reassess the case, that their decision will be supported. And can, just to, to, to confirm that, um, the change in the prosecution policy um, uh, through the prosecution policy review, the change in the approval levels, the anticipated discontinuation policy are all part of a, a suite of practical measures which are seeking to implement and underpin the message that I've been affirming from day one, which is the, um, the responsibility which individual prosecutors have and which um, I trust them to exercise, um, recognising, as I think we all do, that they have to um, fulfil their decision-making functions within the context of the policies that I set. I, that, that's helpful. I mean, slightly surprised that you haven't picked up uh, either of you the, the role of the community justice partnerships, which I understand have delivered some benefit in terms of that two-way flow of information. But can I maybe pick up finally the, the invitation from the Lord Advocate answering the, the, the question you posed earlier about um, whether or not um, the, there should be the same diversionary options um, available uh, consistently across the country. I, I would turn that on its head and, th and, and ask you, Lord Advocate, do you think it is remotely realistic for there to be the same number and variety of uh, diversionary options in Orkney, for example, as there is in, in Glasgow? And, and therefore that gets back to the point of, well, assuming the answer to that is, is no, um, then an understanding of what is available um, uh, in, in, in Orkney um, is, is absolutely essential rather than assuming that there will be the same number and variety as there is in Glasgow or anywhere else um, in, in more urban centres. Yes, I, I certainly didn't, well, I hope I didn't give the impression, didn't intend to give the impression that, that, that I um, believe that, that, that there is the same level. Um, and, and of course, um, uh, uh, it's one of the, um, uh, of course I recognise that the circumstances are different in different parts of the country um, and that the, um, what is feasible in, a, in a, a densely populated part of the country may, may have to be thought about in quite a different way in, in a less densely populated part of the country. I suppose what I was, uh, and, and, and equally I entirely accept that information about the, what is available in a particular area um, is information which should be available to the, the case markers and can be made available to them through the systems that, 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 that we have. Um, um, I, I, I suppose I was inviting a reflection on what the aspirations should be here because if one, put, if one thinks about it, if there is a, 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 a diversionary option which is available for a particular case, that provides the opportunity for the individual who is um, uh, accused of the crime to um, engage in a process which may be more beneficial to that individual, which may be more beneficial to society, and ultimately means that uh, he or she doesn't have a criminal record. Um, and the question one might reflect on is whether um, looking to the um, equal distribution of criminal justice to all Her Majesty's subjects, wherever they may be in Scotland, um, should we be aspiring to have similar opportunities available, um, recognising there will have to be serious differences, uh, significant, there are significant differences in the challenges that are faced in, in delivering options in different parts of the country. Shouldn't that be the aspiration that we, 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 we should seek? If I may briefly pick up on, on that very same point, um, and, and that's not to say that it needs to be exactly the same option that is available. Um, it's, it, it's, it's about a, a, a minimum 
availability and, and agreeing a minimum quality and, 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 and thereafter a minimum expectation about what collectively as a society we might reasonably expect should be di diverted from prosecution consistently across the country. Because if you think about it to its logical conclusion, if the alternative for us is to prosecute and then after a conviction, a decision maker, another decision maker, this time not a prosecutor, but this time a judicial decision maker is left with the opportunity to consider what the disposals are, they are left with the same dilemma if that's not available locally. So all that's ended up is that the individual now has a conviction but not the disposal that anybody might have reasonably thought would be the appropriate one, as opposed to having the disposal. So, so the, it's not a true alternative in that respect, because in many instances, the, 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 the judicial decision maker doesn't have that option available either. Um, so there's, again, a wider system discussion to be had about that, about whether or not that's, that's, um, that's something that um, is regarded as, as acceptable in, in, in modern society. The other point you made was reference to the community justice uh, uh, structures. And, and forgive me, there are so many sources of different um, uh, information that are available. We're, we're, we're enthusiastically engaged in that uh, community justice uh, structure um, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, with the national authority as well. And indeed, these are the kinds of discussions that we're, that we're having in relation to not only what's available locally, but what might be available locally in the future. Um, and, and understanding and having a, a better understanding um, collectively as a system of what really works and thereafter trying to find ways of making that available in a greater number of locations, whether in that form or in another form that, that suits the, 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 the practical um, and uh, the practicalities and the resources available in different locations. But that's, that's, a, that's a worthwhile debate to have rather than simply accept that um, you know, there's the patchwork of services available um, that, 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 that um, may, may lead to, to, to inconsistencies in, in, in approach that, that actually are not conscious choices to, to, to be inconsistent as a result of local issues, but are actually as a result of constraints. Finally, to conclude on the National Initial Case Processing Unit, is there a backlog of cases currently? <laughs> Um, there's a work in hand. We never have described it as a backlog, and that sits at um, just under four weeks of work. Is that would that equate to 5,000 cases, 10,000, 20,000 cases? At the moment, it's sitting. I think the latest figure, and forgive me, because it does change on a, on, a, on an almost daily basis, is just under 16,000. But I'm very happy to write to the committee with the, the latest numbers. Is that not a staggering amount of cases? It's um, it has been uh, higher in the past. Um, I think in, in, in some instances, again, perhaps if I can I'll provide the committee with more detail in relation to how high it's been, how low it's been and, and where we are with it. Could I press you a little bit further and ask, have the unions met with the head of the unit to express concern about how the NICP is operating? Unions are in positive discussions about the new unit and um, can see benefits in the new unit. But there are, as I've said already, um, uh, changes in, in, in the, the unit, for example, in relation to the sheriffdom structure, and will continue to, to, to make changes as appropriate. So have there been several meetings and have they been resolved or have people left discontented and feeling that their comments have not been taken on board, that the meeting was to no avail, for example? Um, I'm not sure what information you have, Convener, but certainly the, the, the information I have is that, that um, positive discussions are ongoing. Could I ask you perhaps to look into that and have a specific do. reason for asking? Mm. Okay, that's a good place to break. Five minutes come for break and back to the second half of the evidence.
resume our line of questioning and Ben. Lord Advocate Kerenagent, I wanted to pick up on a, just a few more specific questions in relation to some of the themes that, that came up earlier. The, the first was in, in relation to, to staffing and um, you talked about the number of staff that will be, uh, that there'll be some natural turnover in terms of cost saving. But I was, I was uh, grateful to see in the submission uh, an entry around trainee solicitors and around the con concerns that we've uh, heard in relation to, to trainees. And in particular, to, in relation to the, the last paragraph in that submission, where you, you state that over the last uh, three intakes, uh, 30 have secured permanent contracts and uh, a further 10 have secured fixed term contracts. I wondered if you could comment about the importance in your mind of the, the trainee process in, in your service and the, and the need to retain uh, top young talent as it comes through the system and if there's a commitment in order to continue in that recruitment drive to, to hold the best talent at your service. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm certainly very committed to the importance of, of um, recruiting able, young, enthusiastic lawyers uh, as trainees. Um, and it's important to recognize that um, uh, trainee solicitors um, are trainee solicitors, that they are mm -hmm. young professionals who play an important part in the service at the same time as receiving uh, training. Um, um, I, I know myself um, as someone who's had a career in advocacy that often what um, uh, some young lawyers want to do is get into court and one of the unique features of the Crown Office traineeship is the um, range and depth of the opportunity to, 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 to engage in that in-court advocacy. Um, so I'm very committed to... Um, to the recruitment of trainees. It's, it's hugely important uh, in my mind for the long-term health of the service. Um, I picked up somewhere um, one of my predecessor's comments that you can't knit deputes. Um, and um, it's, it's essential that we're recruiting um, some of the brightest and best into the service. And is there a similar commitment uh, towards increased retention in order to, to build that capacity in the service? Of well, I, I, I think one could see it in the numbers that you've alluded to. I don't know whether the Crown Agent, from his perspective, um, would like to add anything. Uh, both in context and then the commitment. Um, in terms of context, um, there is absolutely no doubt that the training uh, provided by the Crown remains and, and highly desirable and that's reflected in the number of applicants that we get for the training and, and that actually um, by definition then means that we are um, uh, given an opportunity to select from a really, really um, a, a high performing uh, group and, 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 and that's evidenced um, in the past by, uh, that's been consistently the case and, um, when I started in the service we took on I think it was four trainees. I think the most that we've taken on on any given year is about 21 or 22. This year it's, I think, about 20, 21. Um, so we're maintaining that commitment. And the reason why we're maintaining that commitment is because we know about the quality. And that's evidenced by the fact that of the, the three deputy Crown agents, all of them are former trainees. A very significant proportion of the senior civil service that are there started off as trainees in the organisation. And indeed, a number of former Crown agents um, have been trainees. I wasn't, but a number of them have. And so it's, it's, it, it goes back for a long period of time about the acknowledgement of the quality. There was a period um, in the early days of, of the recession where choices had to be made, and those choices were very, very difficult, and choices that we hadn't had to make previously in relation to retention. I'm pleased to say that through the more recent deputy recruitment uh, processes, a number of those former trainees have now returned to us. And I think that that's an indication of their view of this training uh, that they were provided with and their view of the service. I hope in years to come, frankly, that in future train, uh, recruitment exercises, we might get more of, of that, frankly, lost group of talent um, the, 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 um, the, during those years where we weren't able to um, uh, recruit. And so far as um, a, a, the current uh, position is concerned, I've summarised it in, in the letter about mm -hmm. the, the end position. Some of those initially came in on the short-term contracts that we've already identified as deputies and have sub subsequently uh, uh, secured permanent contracts. So the position, um, as I identified in the letter, is in essence the net position um, of the, over, the, over the last three intakes. 30 of them have now um, uh, secured permanent contracts with the organisation and, and others are on temporary. And certainly it would be my expectation 
um, the, in, 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 uh, when we talked about the, 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 the natural uh, turnover in legal staff um, uh, that, that is, is inevitable. My first port of call, without any doubt, will be to the, 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 our trainees and, and seeking to, to um, recruit as many of those as possible um, uh, to, be, to be the deputies of the future. Thank you. I think the committee would be grateful if we could be kept informed in, in the years ahead of, of uh, what, how that retention level uh, either increases or, or, or is maintained. Um, I was glad you, you raised the point about uh, trained deputies who have then gone to work in other areas of, of practice re returning to the, to the mm. system. And I think it, it was interesting the Lord Advocate's comments earlier around um, proportion of the workforce who are perhaps dissatisfied in thinking about the service. I wonder if comment needs to be made in that area around the fact that some uh, individuals within the service who are thinking about uh, perhaps leaving the service may be doing so for entirely career orientated constructive reasons to go and work for a portion of their career within the defence side of the practice and then come back. I just wondered if that's a point raising in, in order to set the context of uh, why people may or uh, be considering a move away from the service at, at points. I mean, the numbers are the numbers, and I, I can't really, I think, give any concrete evidence uh, as to the particular career choices that people might wish to make. Undoubtedly, um, over the course of a legal career, people make choices for, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, they're not always to do with dissatisfaction with their current um, uh, position. Um, but I wouldn't want to um, overstate the point. I mean, we, we recognise that... Um, um, in the um, sickness statistics, for example, that there, you know, there is there is an issue that needs to be addressed, and Absolutely. the service is um, is uh, actively engaged through the Fair Futures program in seeking to address the areas where uh, there is an issue with with with, with morale. And, and similarly, in relation to those that are on um, uh, fixed term contracts, um, by de by definition, um, a, a good proportion of those will be looking. Um, from their perspective, to, to try and secure greater certainty for their careers, whether they're on the legal side or the non-legal side. So there are any number of motivations that there might be at any given time. And I think from, from our perspective, um, uh, the key commitment is that um, in, uh, within, within the financial envelope available, we will, we will seek to provide as, as much security and certainty um, to, to our, our greatest resource as we possibly can. And just one more question yeah. on a, a separate theme, convener, if I may. The um, uh, spoke earlier around the, the need for procedural reform and how we uh, how, how evidence is, is 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 collected. And I think w one of the interesting themes that's that, that, that's come out throughout this inquiry, which was touched on earlier um, in general terms around witnesses, one point that I was keen to raise on it was specific uh, other pieces of evidence that we took was around specialist witnesses and the amount of cost and inconvenience, a, a, a cost that can be a, a, a caused to, the, to, to the, the, the fiscal service and also inconvenience to those who, who, who wish to or are required to give evidence. And I wondered if you could comment further on what capacity uh, and determination there may be in order to try and make greater efficiencies towards how specialist witnesses are used in particular. Perhaps two, two points there. One is the um, importance of expert and specialist witnesses um, to the prosecution of crime. It's, it's undoubtedly the case that as investigative techniques have um, changed and as the nature of the evidence that we're able to lead has changed, that there is a, a, an increasing use of a greater variety of different types of expert and skilled witnesses. Um, um, so it, it, it's, it's important that, that um, we uh, use those witnesses appropriately. Um, I read um, the evidence from the forensic medical examiners and one couldn't but have sympathy with the um, position uh, in which they find themselves. And um, um, they're a particular category of skilled witnesses who... who um, uh, whose services may be called on in a number of cases um, uh, and uh, that plainly presents them with um, uh, some challenges given the system as it currently operates. 
again, you know, the lesson I take from that is the need to think much more creatively about the system uh, as a whole. First of all, to try and um, minimise the setting down of cases for trial when the trial is not actually going to proceed, because part of the issue is uh, witnesses being cited for, for diets which uh, uh, will simply be adjourned. Um, part of the issue is about trying to secure as early a resolution of a case as possible so that witnesses are not, so that the case is resolved before you get to the point of considering having to cite a witness to a trial diet. Mm -hmm. And part of the answer may be in the greater use of uh, video technology to take evidence from witnesses, and particularly witnesses such as the forensic medical examiners. I'm glad you raised that point, Lord Arvid, because that's, that's exactly what's come through through many of the, the, the different uh, other pieces of evidence that we've taken is that there is a, a real enthusiasm out there to use uh, video technology, yes. whether that's live link or pre-recorded uh, technology. And it, it's, it's uh, enlightening to hear that that's already uh, ready. Uh, there's enthusiasm from yourself. And I don't know if the uh, agent I, I, wants to come in as well. I, 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 think, I think it's perhaps uh, an, uh, um, important to communicate to the committee um, that there is enthusiasm across the criminal justice system, in fact, across the justice system as a whole, uh, for real significant transformational change. And one of the reasons why I was um, um, uh, very pleased to be asked to take on this uh, office and was pleased to accept the invitation to take it on is because I'm personally very enthusiastic for um, the job that I do at the moment at a time when across the system there is a collective commitment to trying to make the system work significantly better for the people whom we're all here to serve. Uh, so a cultural change in, in greater use of technology uh, might not uh, face the, the, the psychological barriers that sometimes others might, uh, well, uh, in, in, an, in, in, a, in a less informed way, think could, on, on, could on perhaps be there. We were reflecting on what we have is, 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 a, is subject to various amendments that have, have taken place in the legislation. Um, criminal procedure that was, was developed in 1995. Um, I don't think I had a mobile phone in 1995. Um, and um, you know, it, it's fair to say that there are real opportunities um, uh, to um, update um, our, our procedures um, in a way which reflects not only the, the technologies that are available, but the public expectation about the use of those technologies. And, and I think that the, the, the evidence that you've heard from the professionals and the, the experts, um, and they are two distinct categories, um, has, has been really um, helpful in, in supporting um, a, a, that cause, and, uh, um, uh, which I think it's fair to say there is, there is, a, there is a, a deal of enthusiasm for. The, the use of, of video technology, for example, is, is about to change with the, with the, the new um, uh, criminal justice uh, provisions, but it doesn't yet go far enough to cover the type of situation that you've described. And that would be a further debate about um, the, the, the propriety and, and use and best use of, of video technology for the taking of evidence, not only in pre-recorded fashion, but also separately, whether or not it, that was a, a way of, of taking evidence live from witnesses, particularly in the categories that, that you've heard. Um, I think we provided some further evidence uh, to the committee at the committee's request in relation to the costs of expert and professional witnesses, which is twofold. First of all, it demonstrates um, in terms of some of the points we were making earlier about the opportunities to make um, a, 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 some savings in this respect by pushing down and really testing whether or not the, the expert and our professional witness is truly necessary for proof of the case and being ever more, more robust with that. But the, the flip side of that coin is that, by definition, as our costs decrease in relation to that, as we apply those tests, that means that we are actually inconveniencing fewer expert and professional witnesses in, a, in asking them to, get to, to engage fully in the court press process all the way to trial. So there's a mutual benefit. But the issue is then, once they are, it is clear that they are required to be engaged in the process. Again, going back to that point about engagement, the same applies to, to them as to you know, broader members of the public who have been eyewitnesses. These are people who um, um, have very significant demands on their time by definition, and therefore we want them to be um, engaging with the criminal justice system um, with a level of enthusiasm about the contribution that they can make, and it's incumbent on the system to try and find ways to, to make that um, as, as straightforward as possible, and there is, there's, there's a way to go on that. 
Thank you very much. I, I'm aware that others want to come in on this point. I just want to conclude by saying look forward to working with you in order to take that enthusiasm forward. Indeed. And reciprocated. Liam? Uh, thank you very much. I, I think Ben's very helpfully raised a, an issue that's come up again time, time and again in terms of the, the advantages of the technology and what it can deliver in terms of system change. I think, though, the committee is also aware of where um, promises around IT uh, as an enabler can, can come unstuck. The I-6 um, uh, fiasco in, in terms of Police Scotland is an obvious example, but there are, but there are others. So I, I, I suppose it's more a plea than a, than a, than a question um, that as, as you take this forward, that actually the, the undertakings you make in relation to what it will deliver are, are as robustly tested as possible um, before they're, they're rolled out. And another plea, I think, would be that while technology can be a great um, enabler in opening up um, access to, to justice, I think if you're looking at this through the prism of somebody in Orkney or Shetland or the Western Isles, what this will deliver will look very different from what, it, what will be the case, I think, um, in, in the central belt. And therefore, I think if this is to, to be deployed in, in, a, in a way that is balanced across the piece, then that perspective needs to be um, uh, understood and taken and um, cognizance of every bit as much as, uh, as it is in, in more urban centres, where, again, the, the, the benefits are potentially huge, but it will be viewed very differently. Uh, that's a point well made, um, and um, uh, as a as a boy from Galloway, I entirely uh, understand the the, the um, different context for for, 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 for for the work that's done in rural areas as opposed to um, the urban centres. Um, um, of course, one of the potential benefits of technology. Um, uh, it, it provided it's robust and, and, uh, and effective is, is precisely to allow us to provide a service across the country um, that, 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 that's consistent. I think, I think if it's seen as an, in, an enhancement, I yes. think the concern is that what it does is it provides an excuse for withdrawing something that's there, uh, deliverable face-to-face, -face, etc. Yeah, no, and, and, and therefore, I think, as I say, that the, the perspective of this will be probably very different in different parts of the country. And I just hope, as, as part of the taking forward of this strategy, that's borne in, in mind. Going, going back to the VIA example, um, the, 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 the provision of information to people at... at at their convenience, um, a, if they have ready access, and that's one of the key issues, and if they are so minded to use those facilities, um, could have very significant benefits. That wouldn't be with the view to then saying that is the sole mode of delivery. That's with a view to saying there is a category of people who are getting their information via this route, which enables resource them to focus on others who are not able or unwilling or otherwise um, a, 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 a not suited to that particular option, having, having the, the, the focus on them and the, the same information um, in pr provided to them in, in different ways. It's about having a menu of options um, available um, to, to um, individuals and also uh, to, to localities. I just drill down a little bit deeper on, on this. Um, there's been quite a reliance from the beginning of our dialogue with you on digital improvements to, to make the system more efficient. Now, I can quite see the case for conference calling and not having to actually physically transport um, uh, a witness, say, from jail to, to prison or an accused, if, if that's not necessary. But are there computer type I six type improvements that you're relying on, and if there are, then what cognizance has been taken of just about every other public service contract in this area, which has ended in tears? If, if I may, um, a, one of the advantages of not having millions of pounds to spend on technology is that you don't try to embark on an exercise like that. Um, and so um, one of the key points that we have, we have invested in in recent years is, is first of all, um, uh, providing a, a stable platform with our existing systems. And that, that exercise has, has, has recently been completed. And um, our director of IT will now uh, characterize this as we now move into the app phase. Um, and, and what that is, is it's about a series of interfaces within our ex to, to, to get the data that we have available out 
to um, the user, whoever that may be, in the appropriate format. So it's about creating gateways into the, 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 the databases that we have already. It's not about a huge redesign of a system. It's about securing gateways to the information that we have in, in, in readily acceptable ways. So for example, um, that would form the platform for um, a, a access to um, a, via information, it would form the, the platform potentially for a, a access for information for a witness website, etc. All of which are things that we're looking at. So it's it's not about um, a, here's a blank piece of paper, let's build something new. It's we have this excellent um, a, a platform upon which we can build. How best do we design ways of of allowing people to have access to that? in a way that is, is, is effective for, for them and, and enables them to, to have a, a level of certainty about, for example, when their case is calling. Thank you. Uh, Fulton, you wanted to, to bring, introduce a new subject. <coughs> Thanks, Convener. I wanted to bring up something that we'd heard during the inquiry in relation to domestic incidents. Um, I, I kind of heard two lines of thought on it. Um, one was that there was a zero tolerance to a uh, domestic instance, which I think was generally accepted. And um, I, I would say that's been a, a good change, given the harm that these incidents can cause to the victims. However, some people were saying that the, the zero tolerance approach um, takes precedent above all else, even when a case shouldn't go to court. And other people have said, no, that's not the case. There would always be a sufficiency of evidence. I wonder if uh, the Lord Advocate would be in a position to um, explain how he sees that particular issue. <clears throat> um, the first point uh, I think to be very clear about is that um, uh, no case of domestic abuse or indeed any other case um, should be marked for prosecution or continued if there is not sufficient evidence. So the starting point um, uh, for decision making in relation to any case but and in, including the cases where we're concerned with domestic abuse is um, is there sufficient evidence in law um, and um, I was not surprised that the prosecutors from whom you heard took it as a uh, I think if I read read the the words on the page correctly something of a, 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 a an assault on their professional integrity to suggest that they would ever mark a case for prosecution uh, if they weren't of the view that there was sufficient evidence uh, in law. Um, the second point is, is this, that um, you, you're absolutely right that against that background or on the assumption there is enough evidence in law, um, the uh, current policy is uh, a very robust one. The presumption will be for prosecution. It is not an absolute presumption, um, but the presumption will be for prosecution. Um, that is... Um, a policy deliberately um, uh, put in place by my um, uh, predecessor, um, and it's deliberately put in place because domestic abuse is a form of criminality which has significant impact on um, the immediate victim and also other members of the family. Uh, and it's a form of criminality which um, for far too long the justice system collectively um, didn't take sufficiently seriously. Um, so I don't apologise for a, a robust prosecution policy, but it's a prosecution policy that starts from there being sufficient evidence in law that a crime has been committed. Um, so those are two important, important things to always have in mind. And it is in a context where, while the prosecution policy is robust and has very strong presumptions, um, they are not absolute. Excellent. And, and uh, thanks very much, uh, Lord Advocate, for that uh, response. Um, you, you'll be aware that, the, that this government has um, made domestic violence and tackling um, that a, a priority, uh, and I think that's supported by by a range of parties uh, across um, across the Parliament. Um, how do, how do you take cognizance of um, government policies generally when implementing them into the uh, criminal justice system? Um, I, I suppose specifically in relation to this, um, as, you, as you, you've alluded to uh, and answered some of, but also you know, wider um, policy implications. Yes, I, I think the first point to make is that um, the setting of prosecution policy is my responsibility. 
and by statute it's a responsibility that I must exercise um, independently of any other person. So it's my job to set the policies. Um, uh, in setting the policy, um, uh, setting prosecution policy, I seek to respond to criminality as it actually is affecting people and communities in this society today. Um, and, um, and also to respond to um, uh, uh, changes, in, in, changes in, in a, an appreciation of different forms of criminality. Um, and domestic abuse is perhaps a, a good example of um, a form of criminality that, as I, as I said a moment ago, for too long wasn't taken sufficiently seriously, where there's a collective commitment across the justice system and, and in government to, uh, to, to tackle it because of the impact that it has on, on individuals and families and therefore indirectly on communities. And um, I reflect that reflect that in the policies that I set for prosecutors. Just on that, there has been a huge increase in the number of complex sexual cases, and obviously that has a pressure on the, on the service. In previous evidence, then, um, we've heard from the Bar Association that there's maybe a, a little bit of concern that um, some cases uh, which are equally complex, maybe involving you know, drugs, public order, dishonesty, violent, prosecuted well, serious cases might be almost being squeezed because of um, the presumption and the focus that there has quite rightly been on domestic abuse and serious sexual assault. Well, I, I would certainly uh, hope that that's not the case. I mean, as, as you know, we, um, within the Crown Office, there are a number of specialist units. One of the specialist units is the Serious Organised Crime Unit. Uh, it's a unit um, which has, within, within its ambit, um, dealing with um, uh, serious organised crime of all sorts. Um, and um, I, I would like to think that, um, well, if you look at the... Um, uh, the the case that I think was popularly known as the, 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 the Coke boat um, case that got a lot of publicity. That's a, perhaps the tip of the iceberg, but demonstrates um, a, a difficult and, and important, significant case uh, involving uh, drugs, which was prosecuted successfully to uh, our, our conclusion. So we've got specialists, uh, specialists within the Serious Organised Crime Unit. Um, I, I, I certainly take the view that um, economic crime um, is uh, something that we have to uh, take uh, seriously. Um, so I don't, I, I don't accept the, the, the proposition that, that that type of case is being squeezed. It is true that we devote resources to sexual offending. Um, that reflects, um, as I said a moment ago, um, uh, a need to address criminality as it is actually affecting people in our society today. We've seen a great, uh, a significant increase in the uh, number of um, serious sexual cases. There are no doubt a number of reasons uh, for that. And as prosecutors, we have to respond. And part of that response is about giving victims uh, the confidence that in, we will take those cases seriously, handle them appropriately, and, 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 and uh, where it's appropriate to do so, prosecute them to a conclusion. I suppose suffice to say that you're aware that the, the resources have to be there to future-proof for all complex cases. Oh, indeed. Yeah. Happy. With that, now supplementaries, it would need to be very brief, Liam and Mary. Yeah, just to follow up to the point, I think um, Fulton McGregor was alluding to it with the evidence that we received from the um, Police Federation in, in relation to um, the, uh, the, the policy around uh, and the guidance around domestic abuse. It was also, I think, very evident in, in what we heard from the bar associations as well, that while they accepted the, the, uh, the policy of zero tolerance, what I think concerned them was an apparent um, zero discretion, um, if I can characterise it as, as that, in terms of the way those, those cases were, were handled. Uh, you quoted, I think, or were alluding to Rachel Weir's evidence where she um, robustly denied this would ever be the case. 
but we've also heard from um, current fiscal deputies um, that they have raised concerns around um, this in the past, which would, I think, to some extent, call into question the absolute assurances we were getting in that regard. Uh, do you see there being a, 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 an issue in terms of um, allowing still levels of discretion, albeit within the framework of a zero tolerance policy, or do you think you've got the balance absolutely right at this stage? Uh, I think but you're absolutely right, and I'm, I'm grateful to you for putting it in, in that way. Um, it's undoubtedly the case that the robust policy is not without its critics and has not been without its critics. And one kind of a debate about whether the policy is right or, or wrong. Um, uh, and that's a, a debate that I'd be uh, glad to uh, engage in. Um, um, I, I should say I, I absolutely don't accept the suggestion that was made that a prosecutor um, would uh, by virtue of that policy, uh, knowingly or deliberately be raising proceedings where they didn't believe there was sufficient evidence to, to prosecute the case. Um, um, uh, uh, that, would be, that would be a serious matter. I think there may be an issue about discontinuation, and the Crown agents um, uh, alluded to, 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 to that. Um, uh, it, it, uh, and as he said, we're looking at a discontinuation policy to reinforce the um, importance uh, of prosecutors continuing to assess uh, cases as they go um, uh, as they go through this, the, the system. Um, but let me ultimately look at the, the data um, of the cases that we of the domestic abuse cases that we prosecute. Um, there is a conviction in 80% of them. Now. Well, certainly 80% of the cases that go to trial, I think, is the, r the right way to put it. Now, that doesn't suggest that um, we're uh, uh, getting the decision-making seriously wrong in relation to that class of case. It is th that go to trial, so that's 80% of, of those that, are, that go to trial. Just, just in terms of the discretion point, um, and I, I think I've tried to allude to this in the letter and accepting the points about data, et cetera, as well, but it... it, it, it if, 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 we, um, if you look at the page 12 of the letter there, I think I've, I've referred to um, our general decisions not to prosecute across, across a range of offences um, are about 4.7% in, in reported cases generally, uh, but are between 7 and 8 um, in domestic abuse. So I suppose the, the basic point with that is that at the very first opportunity when cases are being assessed, it's actually less likely that the prosecutor will decide to commence a domestic abuse case than it is when compared to the average case. Um, and that, to me, is a clear indication of the tests that are applied appropriately in relation to the evidential standards. And let, let's make no bones about it. The, 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 the nature of these offences, and this is something that the, the Parliament will, will doubtless debate in, in, the, in the forthcoming proposition in relation to the Domestic Abuse Bill, are such that, that some of these matters take place by definition in private. And um, so there, there are issues in relation to um, how the offences are corroborated and, and those need to be robustly tested. And I would say to you that, that you know, by not embarking on seven or eight percent of those cases that are reported, that being a higher percentage than the, the, you know, the average case demonstrates that there is a, a critical eye applied at that, that first, um, at that first examination of the case. I think also there was some evidence you mentioned about the Police Federation, um, um, about you know, attendance at a house and um, someone's leaving in handcuffs, I think, or something was the, the phrase that was used. But again, that, uh, 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 that my understanding is that that wasn't borne out by the actual information about police attending at domestic abuse incidents um, and um, the numbers that are then uh, subsequently um, uh, charged. And I think it's my understanding that, um, that, that approximately half of the incidents which um, are, are police are called to result in someone being charged. Now that's rightly or wrongly because that again suggests that the police themselves are applying a filter in relation to the, the incidents that they attend, whether or not actually they find evidence of criminality, but beyond that, whether or not, in the, even in their view, there is, there is um, a sufficiency of evidence in order to be able to bring forth a charge. Just, so, there's, yeah. so, so, so there's a series of filters going through. Yeah. Just, just on that, on that yeah. point, I mean, 
may be possible for you an to answer it now, but sure. what is, wh what's that trend look like in a sense at the, at the, the, the start of a process where there's a zero tolerance approach, there's new guidance issued, people will respond in a particular way. Is there evidence to suggest that people were taking a very much a precautionary post at the, uh, approach at the outset, but that over time that, that discretion is, is, is starting to be kind of reinserted as people are, are comfortable with the way in which the, 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 um, the new policy is to, is to I think there, there, is a, there is an interesting debate about these types of offences generally. So, as Lord Advocate has indicated, there's an issue about the, the sufficiency of evidence and, and the position in relation to sufficiency of evidence, I hope, is, is perfectly clear from the letter. But in terms then of that ongoing review in relation to sufficiency of evidence that, that we spoke about um, and the obligation that there is on the prosecutor, and there's an interesting public debate to be had about that, where some of the stakeholder groups will take one view, some of the judiciary um, may take a different view, some defence listers may take a different view, which is um, uh, when um, there is a reluctance to engage on the part of a key witness, most often the, the complainer victim of, of the allegation, um, there, are, there are those who would say that because of the, the, the disparity in the, in the power, by definition of the nature of the relationship, that actually one of the defence mechanisms for that relationship is to be able to say, I was forced to give evidence. Um, and a, therefore to be able to then say, in light of that disparity, it wasn't me that was choosing to do this to you in the nature of that relationship. There are very complex discussions to be had about this, about the particular nature of this kind of offending and the, the interaction of the power relationship and whether or not the, the individual's desire not to cooperate in a particular case is motivated by fear and what we as a society and we as a system should do to respond to that. And it comes back to that, how do we assist that person to give of their best? What is it that we can do to make sure that, that justice is done? And so it's not simple binary choice of this person's now writing in and saying that they no longer want to cooperate. You have to look at the nature of the offending. You have to look at the position that that person is in. You have to look at what support you can give to that person if the support is what is needed in order to be able to get them to the position which is actually the position that they truly want, which is for, for justice to be secured. And that might not be their initial position in terms of the way that they represent themselves to us. They may just simply say, I, you know, classically, because that's the statistics, I forgive him. Um, but actually, it's because of the power relationship, and actually, that doesn't—that's not a true reflection of the, the, that person's views. And um, I think you'll hear from stakeholder groups. You've probably heard uh, already from stakeholder groups about the views. And this type of offending is different. So when you are debating the domestic abuse bill, um, I think that, that that particular issue will be front and centre about the power dynamic. And. And then yeah. the, I think the Parliament is con this committee is conscious of that and there will be legislation Indeed. coming forward. So in the interests of, of moving on a little bit, can I just press you a little bit on these 80% of convictions? How is that broken down? How many were admonished? How many were given a, a very low fine, i.e. maybe indicating that perhaps the sheriff thought we've gone through this, um, this trial, but to be honest... Um, I, I'm wondering about the sufficiency of the public interest. And of the 20% that didn't go forward, what does that equate to in numerical terms? And the last thing I'll say, because I know that we're, we're conscious of time, um, I noticed, and I, I took this on board as being a very positive um, sign, that in the Crown Agent's uh, letter, he recognises that um, the issue is, uh, is about prosecution and having sufficiency. And I do think there is a contradiction sometimes between, is it the Lord Advocate guidelines or are we now on to Lord Advocate's instructions? And if it's instructions, isn't there co a, a contradiction in terms with then being able to um, issue discretion? So I think what I'd like to say in that, I'm heartened that in the Lord Advocate, in the Crown Agent's letter, there's... Uh, a recognition and accept that this issue is a cultural one that robust and entirely appropriate prosecution policies for certain offending may have led to a perception amongst our staff and I have to say the judiciary as well 
and other um, people who have given evidence that the ability to exercise professional judgment has been curtailed and we are now seeking to address this through our view of the prosecution policies. I understand why you don't accept some of the, um, the evidence here. I think the committee is hugely um, uh, heartened that you have confirmed there would be at least at loose to, to see how this perception has arisen. Yes, well, I'm, I'm very pleased, uh, convener, um, by that remark. Just on the, the general point, um, um, I, I, I needn't, um, I, I, I'm sure, say that you know, I, I set the, the policy, the application of that policy in an individual case depends on the evidence that's available in that case. And I, of course, depend on prosecutors who um, assess the evidence in the individual case, making judgments about how, my, how the policies that I set should fall to be applied. So I think it's important to understand what's meant by discretion here. Um, you know, I can set a, a policy as, I, as I, I do in relation to domestic abuse, which sets a, a strong presumption, not an absolute by any means, but a strong presumption for prosecution if there's sufficient evidence. But of course, the individual prosecutor has to look at the evidence, to assess the evidence, and to decide whether or not it, it meets the test, and then to, to consider um, the other relevant uh, considerations. So, um, and there are other um, areas of prosecution policy where um, uh, staff are given a range of relevant factors that um, tell in favor of a decision one way or the other, uh, again, I can't, um, uh, I, I'm not dictating the outcome of an individual case. I depend on the professional prosecutors who are employed in the service to take my policy and seek to apply that, uh, that those policy, that policy guidance, policy instructions, however you like to phrase it, um, or, to the evidence in the individual case that's in front of them. Um, and just on the 80%, 20% yeah. split, um, I, I think it's um, perhaps important um, to, 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 to recognize that um, um, a, 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 a non-conviction, a, a case that ends up in an acquittal, uh, is not necessarily, it's, it's not necessarily um, because the case should not have been prosecuted. Um, it may well be a case where there was sufficient evidence um, uh, which amply justified the um, decision to prosecute the case, but um, at the end of the day, the fact finder, the, the, the judge or the jury was not satisfied beyond reasonable doubt. It's a high standard. It's a high standard and doesn't just depend on, on sufficiency. And it, it, it would be surprising in any criminal justice system if there were not a proportion of cases and one would, a proportion of cases in which um, the ultimate outcome is, is an acquittal. That's the system working, not failing. The last thing that was brought up was um, a, a real absence of senior prosecutors in summary cases. Um, it's something perhaps that you, you could look at and um, perhaps comment on. Uh, I suppose the, the inference being that maybe someone that's relatively inexperienced then delays to seek more guidance, to go back, to ask. Perhaps this is something that could be taken on board. Perhaps a, more of a presence of senior prosecutors in these cases would help things. You could perhaps have asked the Crown agent to uh, deal with that. If, if I may also just pick up on one of the points. I, I have, you asked for a statistic, and I have the reverse yeah. statistics, which, and perhaps we'll do the maths later. But um, you asked about the, 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 the number of, of, of acquittals and, and, and against a conviction rate of 80%. Um, the, the most recent uh, figures, and these were the ones that were published this morning in the statistical bulletin, show that um, there were 12,374 convictions in 2015-16 uh, for cases with a domestic abuse um, aggravator, um, which um, for the first time is actually a slight decrease. It's a 1% decrease on the year before, and it represents what is characterised in the report as a stabilisation, because um, in 2010-11 there were 8,500 convictions. So in essence, um, it, there has been a jump of about um, uh, 4,000 convictions um, in relation to cases with domestic abuse aggravators, and that 15-16 is the first year where that's now beginning to flatline. 
ask if uh, we could have these statistics and we will recruit it as part of the report. Indeed. That, that's uh, good. Uh, uh, and perhaps if I might, convener, because yeah. I, 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 I wouldn't want um, uh, to have unwittingly um, said something I, I shouldn't. The 80% figure is the figure that I gave you when we appeared in December. It was the statistic available at that point. I have to confess, I haven't checked what the statistics <laughs> this issued this morning we'll take that uh, on show, but we, 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 you know, <laughs> uh, I, I, just for, for, for the avoidance of doubt. Mary, Mary, and um, could we keep it? I know we're trying to cover everything at this time. Mary, and then Mary, followed by Douglas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The exact information I was looking for was pretty much what uh, Liam was able to tease out in some of his questions because it was about that conviction rate because I do think the 8% conviction rate is a, is a very important point. Um, but also the fact that the comments you touched on that were made by the Police Federation and Callum Steele uh, that where he talks about people not being able to have a row in their homes anymore which I do think was very unhelpful and actually just wrong. Um, uh, so I'm glad that we were able to touch on that and, and discuss that a bit. But I also have a, a broader point that I'm really looking for more information on I suppose being completely new to this and obviously learning as we go along is about your relationship, the relationship of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service uh, with the government. I mean, we talked a bit about the, the policy there and your own policy making. And I think when we were in the budget discussions before, I think it, you said that you liaised directly with the, with the finance minister in that, in that respect. So it's really just to, I, I mean, do the government then consult you when it comes to uh, other policies relating to criminal justice? Do they then consult with you? Um, are, and, and I'm just really more interested in the kind of discussions that take place around that and you know how regular an occurrence is that um, yes um, I, 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 I suppose and to some extent that touches on the the, the two hats that I wear um, um, you know, as as a minister myself I'm directly involved uh, within government um, in um, you know, on, on, uh, in, in relation to um, uh, the, the, as it were, the government process of decision making. Um, when we're dealing particularly with justice policy issues, um, justice policy is a matter for the Cabinet Secretary for Justice. Um, but um, if justice officials are um, uh, uh, considering or dealing with a, a, an issue that uh, relates to um, criminal justice and engages the interests of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, I'd be surprised if they didn't uh, engage with the officials within, within the Crown Office and within the service um, in relation to those matters. And I suppose there's a, 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 perhaps a broader point about justice policy, which is that we are in this moment when um, the various institutions that are engaged in the justice system have a um, common commitment to real reform that will make a difference to, 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 to people and um, by the nature of it, the Crown Office is, is very actively engaged in that, in that process. I don't know if Crown Agent might wish to add from a <coughs> practical point of view. Um, from the practical works. perspective on, the, on, on the, the policy side, we have a policy unit and um, they liaise with uh, Scottish Government um, officials um, when there are proposals in relation to legislation to ensure that um, a, a, the impacts on prosecution and perhaps on, on, on a, a, the criminal process generally, um, I, those, those views are, are taken. Um, and indeed, in some instances, um, a, albeit exceptionally, the, um, the genesis of, of proposed changes actually has in the past been um, the, the prosecution service. So again, going back to the, the, the domestic um, abuse uh, bill, you'll recall um, perhaps that the former Solicitor General um, was um, a, a key proponent of, of those, those changes. Um, so there is a there is a, a, a dynamic relationship in relation to the, the ability to make um, uh, proposals and indeed um, I think that that's reflected in the types of work that we're alluding to both in terms of the evidence and procedure review, how we intend to take the, the, the Thompson report forward etc. It, it is on the basis of that, that collective um, willingness to, to reform and improve. Maybe. Thank you. Um, I'd be interested in your opinion on whether you think the establishment of permanent domestic abuse um, courts across Scotland would be beneficial. Um, 
I, I think um, one has to approach that issue um, perhaps mindful of the point that uh, Mr MacArthur made that um, we are dealing in Scotland with a a, a very diverse uh, country where the um, um, the um, concentrations of population uh, are, are quite different in different parts of the country and what is practically feasible in one part of the country may be um, much more difficult to achieve in another part of the country where the, the population is, is, is different and the, the throughput of cases is different. Um, I think the, it, you know, what seems to me um, um, uh, key is that those who are prosecuting these cases um, are appropriately trained um, and are appropriately skilled to prosecute the cases um, regardless of where they are and regardless of whether the ca it's in a court that's called the domestic abuse court or, or, or not. Um, and and you know, the practical kind of issue that could arise if one were to take the view that one needed to have a dedicated domestic abuse court um, and that domestic abuse cases could only be tried in those courts in the more um, dispersed parts of the country is one would have to, um, one might well have to see people traveling much further to attend the domestic abuse court um, or one might have a situation where the throughput of cases is such that the, that court sits uh, um, uh, relatively infrequently and the time scales get longer. So I think there are a range of issues that one has to think about um, and for me the key issue is not about what the court is called um, but whether we're, we've got um, appropriately skilled people who are handling the cases um, and, um, and therefore the case is being appropriately dealt with by all those involved, um, whatever you call uh, the particular court. If, if I might seek to add to that, I mean, obviously, um, it, it is a successful model in a number of locations, and, mm -hmm. and um, the decision on, on court programming um, rests with each of the, the sheriff's principal. And I know that they are cognizant of the, 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 the benefits, um, but they are um, weighing those um, advantages and disadvantages as, as set out by the Lord Advocate. Um, uh, to determine whether or not um, it, it would be appropriate to introduce um, a, a domestic abuse court in a particular location. But I can um, advise the committee that there are live discussions um, about the introduction of, of, of further domestic abuse courts in, in, in locations across the country that, where there currently aren't any, but, but the, that, that's an incremental process based on, on those considerations. And just on the other point in relation to the the um, a, a additional additional funding um, that uh, did uh, mean that we were able to uh, recruit additional prosecutors, which meant that we were able to to man courts that were would not otherwise have sat, um, uh, focusing on on domestic abuse uh, uh, cases, and in particular trying to ensure that on an incremental basis um, the time between um, first calling and trial um, was reduced initially to 12 weeks in year one and thereafter down to, to 10 weeks um, across the country. And um, I think I'm right in saying that we are now under 10 weeks uh, across the country and if we're not it will be an exception of 0.5 of a percent somewhere. Um, uh, uh, but it's, it, So that in itself has been a very significant development in trying to uh, progress these cases, regardless of whether or not there is a, a bespoke domestic abuse court. Um, do, do you think, though, the establishment of a permanent court in, in, in a specialist area like that um, would help to build the specialist knowledge that, that prosecutors would need? But not only that, it would also help to, to build the relationship between the prosecutors, the support organisations that they exist to support the victims, and, and it would also help to build confidence in, in the prosecution of these cases. The, the, there's no doubt that it's a model that works well where, where, it, where it operates. Um, the, the issue, as we said, is, is, is um, what, what is the balance between that and the disadvantages mm -hmm. of, for example, um, I, and forgive me, I will pick random locations, and they are truly random, but just for illustrative purposes, if there were to be one in, in Inverness, um, but, but that was also to deal with, with cases from WIC. Um, there is a question arises because at the moment um, domestic abuse cases in WIC will be dealt with within the parameters that I've talked about in relation to the first calling to trial being within the 10 weeks. If they are being called to Inverness, there's an issue about A, whether or not it would be possible still to meet that 10 weeks, and also separately, 
um, would the witness want to travel to Inverness if that's where the domestic abuse court was? So there, there are there are there are pros and cons in relation to this that just need to be carefully considered in each instance. But there is no doubt that that where it has been introduced and where there are sufficient cases uh, um, uh, to 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 justify a, bes a bespoke and exclusive court, for want of a better phrase, that deals only with domestic abuse cases, it has been a success. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Can I ask how many times the Crown Office have paid uh, damages or compensation to victims or witnesses as a result of being detained because of errors by the Crown Office? I don't have that statistic to hand, but I can get it for you. Um, would you also be able to provide the amount in compensation that's been paid out? I would. Yep. Uh, that would be very good. Uh, maybe over the last each year for the last 10 years or... 10 or, years. If that's okay. Yeah. I'll try to. Whatever <laughs> it can be done. Uh, maybe, Lord Advocate, if I can ask you, we've had uh, a, a small amount of discussion about Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Prosecution, uh, and there was some concern about the division in responsibilities between your office uh, and their office. I don't really want to focus too much, because time is, is short, on that specific role, but... Would you agree that it's important that your office and the Crown Office are as accountable as possible to the public? Um, it's, certainly, it's certainly right that, we're, uh, that, that, that I am accountable. One of, one of the reasons why we're here today, one of the reasons why the service has um, as its head someone who is um, by by statute and constitutionally required to act independently, but who is also a minister, is uh, it provides that conduit of accountability to you as parliamentarians who are in turn um, uh, re 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 represent the, the, the public at large. Um, so the, that, that's the structure of, of, of accountability and it's absolutely um, right that it should be, it, it should be so. Um, at the same time, it is important that um, as prosecutors and as a prosecution system, we are very clear that we act independently of any other person. It is absolutely essential uh, to the integrity of the justice system, both just, ju that just as the judiciary um, act independently in the decision-making that judges make, um, and the judiciary is, is independent in the role that it plays in our system, that at the same time the prosecution um, service acts independently, um, and that, um, as I said earlier, you know, I exercise my responsibilities as head of the system independently, personally, and um, you know, um, uh, are uninfluenced by any other uh, person. That's what you said in, in the, the December meeting when we were here. Really, though, I, I think I'm getting from you that you do agree there should be openness, transparency, that, that you shouldn't be held to a different level from other public agencies in any way. Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, like, I mean other, yeah. uh, like other public agencies, um, that we have... Um, uh, there will be things that um, we... Uh, you know, we have obligations on the Data Protection Act. We have obligations of confidentiality. We deal with um, um, highly sensitive information about individuals mm -hmm. and about individual cases. And therefore, um, uh, there, there are things which um, we, we may not, uh, uh, and it would be quite improper for us to disclose, but in terms of the operation of the, of the service, um, transparency, accountability uh, is, is, is something that um, uh, certainly I, for my part, am very comfortable with. Yeah, that, that's useful to hear, and there will always be occasions where you can't release information. I fully accept that. But do you think it's right in this day and age that your office uh, is not... If I had a freedom of information request into your office, mm -hmm. you responded to it in such a way that I didn't feel fully answered my query. Yours is the only office, along with the Commissioner of Freedom of Information Requests, the Information Requ uh, Commissioner, who I can't appeal that decision against. And surely, if, if you want to be as open and transparent as possible, as you've just said in your last two answers, that would be a way to show, uh, to uh, ensure that your office, we can appeal decisions that your office put out uh, to the Information Commissioner. Yes. Um, I have to say, I didn't know there was any particular rule that applied to my office, so um, I, I'll, um, 
uh, I, I can certainly find out the, the position there, but um, you know, we, we, in relation to freedom of information, we will obviously comply with the, uh, the, the, the legal structures and the legal requirements that have been uh, uh, um, uh, placed upon us by Parliament. Yeah. It's uh, part four of the 2002 Act, uh, section 47, uh, which states that uh, the applications are excluded for appeal to the Commissioner if it's about the Commissioner, a Procurator Fiscal or the Lord Advocate. And I think there are examples where you know, a, a legitimate case has been put to your office and presumably uh, your pre predecessor's office, where I think an appeal would be useful to tease out more information. So I, I, I'm grateful for you putting on record that there would be uh, no general objection to that. Could I quickly move I, on to... Yeah, I, I mean, you might if I might just there. say... Sorry. In your uh, link okay. to the inquiry, yes. so if you Could, don't mind, yeah. Yeah. we'll I, move on. I, I mean, I just want to be very clear Absolutely, that... Absolutely, Lord Advocate. If I might just be clear about one thing. I mean, I'm not cited on this issue, as the, uh, as the convener has alluded to. Uh, I mean, as I said a moment ago, we'll operate within whatever structures Parliament imposes on us. Whether, whether it would be appropriate or not to change any particular rule is something that I'm not expressing any view yeah. on today. Yeah. We're looking to cover the issues that we haven't covered so far in the inquiry. Finish. I wanted to ask, uh, no one's asked about inquiry point, I don't think. Um, and really, th this was something we got from the defence solicitors very early on, and uh, you accepted in, in December that there was a change to this 0300 number, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think. One of the things that, that really struck me in your 20-page uh, document, uh, first of all, is that the average time for people to wait on the current inquiry point is between one and four minutes. Now, an average... Uh, at the upper end of four minutes uh, is a long time. You know, the Lord Advocate paused this morning for maybe 10 or 15 seconds. If we multiply that by 16 se uh, times, that's how long people are waiting to get through to a service which should be giving them information. And I wondered if I could ask the Crown Agent, does he believe that is why, in, in subsequent points that he makes in his letter, there's been so little interaction and uptake in changes provided by your service and offered by your service, because really, um, you know, defence solicitors and such like uh, have had so many feelings in terms of trying to communicate with the service. And if that's not the case, why do you think when you are putting forward all these alternatives, there's such a low uptake from defence solicitors who are making it very clear they're not happy with the current system? Okay. Um, first of all, the alternative methods that I've listed um, were illustrative for the purposes of demonstrating the um, the efforts that have been and will continue to be made to resolve uh, some of these issues and also to emphasise the point that's been raised earlier about one size does not fit all and that there are particular uh, solutions which work quite well in certain localities with certain cadres um, of the local defence bar and there are others which are less successful. Um, the majority of the solutions, for example, the, 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 I think there was one reference to um, a, a deputy actually um, a carrying their mobile number um, I, I, I worked mobile around with them, and, that, and, and I can't recall whether I listed this one, but it was, they didn't get a call in eight months. You, you know, um, so it, there are a number of solutions that are, that are, that are uh, put forward that don't involve the inquiry point number. I think that one of the key things that I'm acknowledging in the inquiry point number is to the extent to which the 08 number is seen as inhibitor, that's being addressed. Um, insofar as the waiting times are concerned, that was illustrative of you know, being open about the, the, the realities of, of, of the, the current service provision in relation to that. I think from my perspective, the key is, is how then when the individual gets through, whether or not their issue is addressed, whether or not they get the information or whether or not they're, they're signposted and passed on to someone who can provide that to them. And I think, again, there are references there in my, in my letter to the fact that there's a requirement for improvement. So, so whilst I think, um, I, again, I can provide you with statistics in relation to this, happy to do so, but my recollection is that, that, that over 80% of calls um, that come into the inquiry point are actually resolved by staff at the inquiry point. There are those which require to be put forward to, to other individuals in the organisation. And I th my sense is that that's where the, the, the vulnerability in the system ri arises, is where there's an effort on the inquiry point uh, perspective to try and then get a hold of the person who the solicitor or the member of the public is saying they need to speak to. 
And I think the part of the issue is, do they need to speak to that person or do they need to speak to the person who has access to the information that they can give them? And that's why, for example, one of the things I'm talking about here is, is being able to put um, a, a lawyer into inquiry point who would actually be able to, for example, conduct a plea negotiation because one of the benefits of our system is that the material is available online. And so therefore it shouldn't matter whether or not the call is through to David Harvey or to you know, John Dunn or anyone else in the organisation. It's the key is whether or not the person that you speak to is able to resolve the issue for you. Um, the other thing, though, that, again, I tried to convey in the correspondence is that um, the, 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 the phone numbers and um, a, a, a points of contact, etc., are really only part of the issue. You've heard issues in and around CJSM, which is a service that we sought to provide because there was an issue in relation to the, the secure transfer of, of, of personal data, which I'm sure all of us would support that it does need to be securely transferred. And that was a, a, a service that was already available um, that, that um, a, a was made then available to a, a, the defence bar. It's not perfect. Um, and I think we've completely acknowledged that. And there's a need to drive forward with a, with a better system, whether that is partially a, a, a bespoke website with, with communication or whether or not that's um, a secure email system. I think where, where the difficulty has arisen in the past, though, is that there's a, there's a collective responsibility there. Rather than us saying, here's CGSM, that's, that's, that's you know, the solution for you to be able to transfer data securely, not only to COPFS, but to the court service and in between to the legal aid board, etc. There is an issue about ensuring that, again, as a system response, members of the public can have confidence that their data is being securely transferred. And that's why I'm saying that in the correspondence that there's a, there's a real need to, to have further engagement to the Law Society to understand how um, solicitors will meet those obligations and how we can assist them in doing so. Very pleased if um, the remaining questions could be succinct and the responses to Mary. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you both about health and, health and safety cases because you'll know that we heard um, some quite concerning evidence about the, the low level of, of prosecution, particularly in relation to employers' liability insurance. Is there a particular difficulty or is there a particular reason that, that there is a, a very low prosecution level in, in liability cases? Um, can I first of all say that um, it's important, and I'll deal with the employer's liability point mm -hmm. very, um, in, in a moment, it's first of all important not to assume that every accident at work involves a, a crime uh, in mm. breach of the criminal offences in the, in the Health and Safety Act. Um, that's an, uh, uh, important to, to make that clear. Um, we, can own, we, we, we prosecute cases that are reported to us um, uh, in the context of health and safety, the primary reporting agency is the health and safety executive. Um, we are able to direct the police to make inquiries. We don't direct other reporting agencies such as the health uh, and safety executive. So we depend for the cases that we prosecute on those that are reported to us by the HSE. And the, the Crown agents, I suspect, will, um, uh, while I've been speaking, have identified the statistics of, of, of cases reported, health and safety cases reported to us, which we prosecute and in which a conviction is secured. Um, so part of the answer is we take the cases that come to us, are brought to us, and we um, make this prosecutorial decisions and prosecute them appropriately. If there is... Um, uh, in relation to the particular issue about employers' liability cases, um, if, if these cases are not being brought to us, um, there may be a question to be uh, picked up with uh, the reporting agency, and um, that's certainly a question that we can uh, raise with them. And Crown Agent, I suspect you've got the numbers it's, there. It's, I, th I think it's reflected in my Mission. correspondence, I, yeah, I, so I wonder whether in light of time... Um, and there was a positive response about looking at the, the low um, uh, prosecution rates in your letter. In, indeed, and, but it's, it's yeah, subject to not being able to, to direct. The negotiation. Yes, I, and can, I, can I just briefly ask you as well, the other concern that was raised in relation to health and safety cases, was the view that health and safety is almost treated like, like civil cases. And I know, Mr Harvey, from, from your letter, you say that that is, that is not the case. But health and safety cases quite often enter into very lengthy negotiation periods when, when there's liable to be a guilty plea at the end of it. There is no time limit on, on the length of time it can take to negotiate the case to, to reach an agreed settlement. And it causes quite considerable distress quite often to families. Um, is there anything that could be done to 
assist that process or shorten the negotiation process? Well, it, it, it's, it, I think the point I was trying to make in, in, in the letter is mm. it's not a matter of policy to have that approach. Um, and, um, but in terms of, of, of the realities of, of um, a, a seeking to um, identify the, the issues in these cases, they are and amongst the most complex that we mm. do deal with. And they are also, um, candidly, because of, of the resources available to some of those who would be um, accused, some of those um, uh, best resourced to defend, mm. um, is perhaps the way to look at it. And so, therefore, it's the, the um, a, a, many, many points are, are tested, um, uh, shall we say, and there, there's a clear benefit in ensuring that um, a, when the charges are liable, that those, li those charges are um, um, appropriately tested. There was, again, by way of historical context, a time um, before we had the specialist approach, and the case law, regrettably, is, is littered with these, um, where um, the Crown um, used to, to try to, to, to bring forth um, uh, prosecutions, particularly in health and safety cases, and the courts would either uh, fling out the entirety or at least a significant part of, of the Crown case because of the way in which they were liable. Um, and that was pre-specialisation. Um, and those um, a, a lessons from the past have been learned about ensuring that in these most complex of cases, the Crown libels, that which can be proved as a result of that specialist input, and also, as I say, subject to the testing of, of some of the best resource defences that are available. Okay. Thank you. And Rona. Um, yes, I wonder if the Lord Advocate would comment um, on the implications for the service if um, the effective um, prosecution arrangements and cooperation between partner agencies in Europe is diluted following the decision to leave the EU. Yes, it's it's a feature of or it's a feature of, of, of the world we live in that um, uh, crime is not confined by borders. Um, uh, we haven't had time to touch on uh, cyber crime, although. Be, be, be happy to discuss that. There's a good example of a type of criminality which uh, uh, doesn't have any um, regard to jurisdictional boundaries and people move around um, uh, 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 and um, uh, uh, in a way which means that in order to um, uh, be effective in dealing with some of the challenges we face in the criminal justice uh, system, we have to be um, engaged with agencies in other parts of the world, including in Europe. Um, and um, uh, going back to the point about specialization, um, our international cooperation unit is the, the central authority for mutual legal assistance in Scotland. I am personally what is called the territorial authority for Scotland under the international uh, the Crime International Cooperation Act of 2003 and I have responsibilities in relation to extradition. So it's something that I personally get uh, involved uh, with. Um, it's hugely important that we've got effective uh, relationships um, with um, uh, criminal justice agencies in other countries. It's also hugely important that we've got the legal and institutional structures in place which allow us effectively to um, uh, deal both with um, investigation and evidence gathering and also extradition both from Scotland to other countries um, so that we are not harbouring criminals here and also to bring people from other countries to Scotland when we wish to uh, prosecute them. So those, those mechanisms are important to the work that we do and departure from the EU will not change that. It will not change the importance of that. Um, I, I have spoken publicly about the um, importance as we move uh, 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 forward with the uh, Brexit process. Um, uh, however that unfolds um, uh, in um, making sure that we maintain the advantages of those international arrangements and that we've got secure mechanisms in place so that um, whatever the outcome of that process, um, uh, our ability to deal with transnational crime is not diluted. So are, are you um, sort of confident that the practicalities of being able to do that after the Brexit processes or when it's been uh, going through the process will be 
will be realised? I mean, or is it? I understand what you're saying about the importance of it, but yes. will it be practically um, possible to well, have the, the same effectiveness? Well, there are decisions that are yet to be made, and I think what I can uh, uh, properly do, wearing my um, uh, in, independent prosecutor's hat, is make clear that unless we are able to, unless the right decisions are made. Uh, our ability to deal effectively with transnational crime will be adversely affected. Um, it was encouraging to see that the United Kingdom government um, uh, decided to opt into the new Europol regulation. Um, that, of course, um, uh, is a decision made uh, for now. Um, what the position will be um, uh, as and when we leave the uh, European Union remains to be seen and is a matter of, you know, which, upon which, uh, so far as I'm aware, decisions are yet to be made. All I can say, it is important the right decisions are made. And Liam? I'll take you from the, the macro back down to the, the <laughs> micro in terms of direct measures. You'll be aware of the, the concerns that were raised with us around fiscal fines. At your note, um, Mr Harvey, I think, helpfully um, responded to, to some of those. Um, Clearly, the, the, the concerns expressed to us that there's perhaps a, an, an overzealous or an inappropriate uh, deployment of, of fiscal fines um, in instances where, uh, potentially as a result of cumulative fines, but, but not exclusively that, there was an inability to, to pay. There would almost be a denial of, of justice and it being diverted away from, from the court. Um, it would be helpful to, to get your response to that, but particularly the point, I think, in your, in your evidence which suggests that more than... 80% of direct measures are paid, which would suggest 20% aren't, and therefore, whatever the numbers here, that there is an, an, an element to which those fines aren't being paid, a, a fifth of those um, are, are not being paid, even with the allowance for um, staggered payments over a, uh, over, or instalments over a period. Do you want to add? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, in terms of the, the information provided in the letter, I think I've, I've tried to indicate um, a, a, from SCTS information rather than COPFS mm. information, the, the way in which a, a, the, that is impacting in relation to a, a number, numbers of individuals or percentages of individuals who um, have had more than one uh, fiscal fine during uh, a period of time. Um, the other thing that... that um, I think is, is important, as I understand it from the, the evidence that was given by um, Eric McQueen, the chief executive of SCTS, is that, that that's at any given moment in time that there are still collections ongoing and that the, the, they strive to, to, to recover um, over, a, over a period of time the full amount, but at any given time there is an outstanding balance, if you like, which, which is a moving feast as new fines come on board. Um, Insofar as the, um, the, the use of, of the fines are concerned, and uh, forgive me for once, I've not managed to, to find the relevant page um, I, I, to, to draw on um, I, in relation to the statistical bulletin, um, but um, it, it is available and published today. Um, I, and um, if, if I have a moment, I can perhaps draw the figures to your attention that the fiscal fines and fixed penalty numbers have actually gone down quite significantly. In, in percentage terms. So, I, again, I think that, that um, I, I, would, I would draw your attention to, to, to that and, and allow you perhaps then to, to reflect and draw conclusions based on that as to whether or not that's a, a, an ongoing live issue or whether or not actually there has been a, a, a change in the approach in relation to the numbers of fiscal fines and the numbers of fixed penalties. It would be good if you could send that, that information, but I suppose the, the issue is one in five. That's a loss to the public purse of... Yeah, quite a considerable amount of money and something you're always seeking to improve. As far as I'm aware, that is the end of our questioning. There's just one thing I wanted to say at the very end. Well, first of all, could I ask you just to, to um, just give a brief explanation of the Fear Future programme, how you liaise, how you get the feedback from, from staff? Um, so, so the, the, the Fair Future programme is, is in essence um, a stage two, something that arose from, from um, our, our shaping the future programme, when, which was the, 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 the restructuring that, that took place. And, and during the course of that very significant staff engagement, we got over 1,800 lines of feedback. Um, 
So it was, it was gathered in a, in, in a wide variety of ways. So it was gathered in face-to-face -face discussions. It was gathered by the ability to provide information online. It was provided by the ability to provide anonymously. It was actually to the point where um, a, you, you could even, um, on, a, on a poster, put up your comment, yeah. and the poster would be collected. There a huge range of, of ways of, of collecting feedback. And as I say, uh, there was a very, very significant level of engagement. Um, and a, with regular updates, regular face-to-face -face discussions with, with staff who were leading on that work, and we would seek to, to continue with that level of commitment going forward. That's very helpful. So I'll just conclude by saying that um, I think that's encouraging. Um, but I would just ask you again to reflect on the workload issue and um, also the fact that this committee has had absolutely no success, really, on anyone coming with concerns about various things in the Cisco and, you know, appearing in front of committee. They've given written evidence. They've um, appeared in private. Uh, and there was a little bit of a fear that if you criticised, then it would affect your um, career projects. From the beginning, we've been very encouraged of your can-do attitude and the need to move forward and, and address um, the issues that have been raised, either perceived or, or otherwise. And I hope you would take that one on board particularly. Um, I'm encouraged that there was anonymous feedback and various ways to, for members to engage, but um, that would certainly be much appreciated. Can I thank you both for what's been a very long, but a very worthwhile and detailed evidence session. Thank you. I hope it's in order for me to thank you for giving us the chance to come and um, give evidence in, uh, at length and also for um, all the work that the committee's put in um, in, and in eliciting evidence, which I hope you're reassured is evidence that um, we are um, taking on board, have taken seriously and which to a significant degree reflects issues which um, the service is already seeking to address. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. I'm going to move straight on now to public petitions. There are three public petitions in front of us. I propose to, um, to defer the first two to next week, but to take the third one, which is the independent into the inquiry to the McGrackey conviction, really in deference to the fact that we have witnesses who have sat through all of this evidence session and have come for that specific issue. Um, the, the petition is discussed on page four of the Clark's paper. Annex F, um, F provides an update from the Justice for McGrathy. Um, the committee had previously kept the petition open pending the completion of Operation Sandalwood, which we understood at that time would end in 2016. But um, According to the Clark's recent update, then it's ongoing and we don't actually have a date for its conclusion. So the committee is asked to consider and agree if any action it wish to take in relation to this petition. Do I have any comments? Stuart Stevenson. Um, the petitioner in their uh, letter to us uh, concludes by asking the committee to allow the petition to remain open until the conclusions of Operation Sandwood uh, have been announced. I think that's a reasonable request and we should accede to it. Any other um, views? In, in that can, case? Yeah, can I just reiterate the points that, that, that Stuart Stevenson has made? I would have made the points if he hadn't, so I'm grateful to him. Okay. Um, in that case, the petition remains open. And moving on now to agenda number four, uh, subordinate legislation. The fourth item of business today is consideration of two negative instruments. These are the Police Service of Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, SSI 2016 oblique 419, and the Fireman's Pension Scheme Amendment on Traditional Provisions Scotland Order 2016, SSI 2016 oblique 431. The um, DPLR Committee has made no comments in relation to these instruments, and I refer members to paper Four. Do members have any comments? No comments. Um, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make recommendations in relation to these instruments? Agreed. Thank you.
Agenda item number five is the Justice Subcommittee on Policing. Mary, um, you have something very briefly to say on yes, this? Yes, briefly. Um, there's a note from the clerk and there's also an XA which briefly um, details our work programme. I am happy if it would assist the convener in the committee to defer discussion of this to next week when we'll have more time. I think that would be appreciated. <laughs> Move into private session now. We are in private session. Next committee meeting will be the 24th of January when the main item on business will be a roundtable evidence session on demand-led policing. And um, I think we've more or less emptied the public gallery, so move into private session now. And